inflation's coming down, but we don't think it's going to come down quite as fast as markets are pricing in. I think inflation's really dying out quick right now, but I think it's probably got another leg up. I don't think we've licked the inflation problem, and so that's why we're not anticipating that the Fed's going to cut rates. They are still fighting inflation. They are still dealing with their core mandate. If we listen to Chair Powell, effectively he was saying, we can't really give you forward guidance at the moment. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramlitz, and Tom Keen. On Monday, after an elacious week last week, some of us are back. Some of us are on assignment. John Farrell on assignment this week. We'll have to see where that uh, goes. His entourage said he couldn't be with me, and I said, well, okay. But Lisa's here after surviving last week. I was not here. Give us one anecdote of the exhaustion you, John, and our team faced last week. Well, I think that you're highlighting it quite well with your facial hair. And I will say, I know that you're going to blame me for it, but I just want to make this very clear. You alone are responsible <laughs> for this situation over here. No, it's my stylist. Trust oh, yeah? me. Yeah, she had a pina colada in her hand. Um, <laughs> well, no, but in all honesty, <clears throat> the takeaway is that people are completely repricing their expectations of rate hikes off the table and rate cuts very much on the table. Suddenly, a massive repricing, the uh, re de disinversion of the yield curve. Yeah. The most poised to be the most for a month going back to 2008 to give you a sense of how much and how quickly right. people are repricing in uh, rate cuts. And what we're going to see with a great set of conversations today on equity, Ben Laidler with us in a moment, Michael Wilson of Morgan Stanley uh, down the road as well. Adam Posen will join us for the essay of the weekend. No question about that. Dr. Posen uh, later on in the 8 o'clock hour. And to me, I go back to first principles, which in your world, Bramo, is BTMM Go. And I'm sorry, there's a number. Jim Bianco says there's a number of 5% ways I can earn money on that screen. Yeah, there is. Although if you got in a while ago, you probably could earn more because you could see how rapidly <clears throat> we're repricing short-term rates just simply because of these rate cuts and these expectations. I will say the big takeaway for me last week was that nobody seems to have his handle on anything, number one, except that credit conditions are tightening and that's going to restrict the economy, number two. And then three, the fact that we're looking at a market that is all over the place, just go home and not trade and that's probably the best thing because we're basically flat in the month for the S&P. There's some winners there as well, and there is some action. Keith Horowitz at Citigroup, I noticed, putting a buy recommendation on uh, MTM up in Buffalo and uh, Key Bank of Cleveland as well. So there's a little bit going on here. It'll be fun to get started on a week with a lot of economic data. Michael McKee to attend uh, is, is well. On the data front, sort of like Friday, there's a lift in the equity market, and rather than futures up 20, the levels... Can you imagine with the angst of last week, SPX 4,000, Dow halfway back to 33,000, NASDAQ 100 near 13,000 as well, the VIX at 21.94. Lisa, maybe that doesn't scream bull market, but nevertheless, resilient equities given the uproar. Well, that's the reason why I say, you know, almost the best strategy for people is just hiding under their beds and just hoping that things are going to be okay. Because <clears throat> if you wait long enough, they'll go back to what they were just a few uh, a few months ago. I'm going to look at uh, West Texas Intermediate, still under $70 a barrel, alluding to what Lisa said about a slowing guesstimate on the American economy, 69.79 West Texas uh, Intermediate. We got a further inversion today, all on a correlated risk on feel. I don't want to oversell that. Uh, i got lots of other things to talk about, but I think before Ben Laidler, I need a briefing. Where, where do you begin? Do you begin with the France-Israel protests, or do you begin with our world? I'm not sure which. There are a lot of geopolitical issues that I am watching, or what we heard about, uh, you know, Belarus and the potential for nuclear <clears throat> yes, threat thank you. with thank Ukraine. You. I mean, there are a yes. lot of very important issues geopolitically. When it comes to markets, people are trained on any wisdom they can glean from oh, uh, policymakers. And you hear from the ECB, uh, ECB member Isabel Schnabel at 11 a.m. She speaks at Columbia University. University, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, Bank of England, Governor Bailey to speak at the London School of Economics. Very curious to hear whether we start to hear a shift in tone from uh, the German and the and the ECB members, <clears throat> given how hawkish they have been. Then at 1 p.m., we get a $42 billion auction of two-year uh, notes. Mm -hmm. I am curious. I know on one hand, you could say, who cares, right? On the other hand, we're looking at a situation where there's been a massive repricing, complete whipsaw action in terms of day-to-day -day volatility. Right. So suddenly, we're where are we now? Well, for radio, this is a John Farrell chart from a 5.10 down to 3.xx. Is it a flight to quality? I mean, is a two-year yield just simply 
flight to quality. I mean, well, I mean, that's uh, that's something that people are, are talking about. There's also a complete repricing of how much the Fed's going to cut rates this year, and you can see that in Fed funds futures, which correlate to some of that move. Are we sure they're going to cut move. rates this year? Well, they say no. The market says you know yes. We shall see. This. And then at 5 yeah. p.m., we get Fed Governor Philip Jefferson uh, having a conversation at Washington and Lee uh, University. Do we get Great any school. clarity from <laughs> they we were get... in my bracket okay, <laughs> yeah, good. i'm glad to hear it uh, how's that bracket doing I, honestly there are real questions about what kind of clarity these policymakers can give at a time where there's so little clarity i mean we heard from uh, neil kashkari on. yesterday I, I... it came out and he basically was like it's too early to say anything because we don't know how much the credit conditions are going to tighten at smaller and medium-sized banks as a result of some yeah. of the uh heightened funding concerns i would suggest we are in a crisis the two-year yield 3.92 uh, percent he has been Wonderful about courage to be in the market. Benjamin Laidler joins us now, global market strategist at eToro. Ben Laidler, simple as I can, where do I find the courage this morning to own equities? I think, if anything, you should be more positive equities now than a month ago. I think this bank scare, and I use that word rather than crisis, I think that accelerates everything we were expecting this year. I think growth is going <clears> to <throat> slow faster. Inflation is going to come down faster and interest rates are going to come down faster. So where a few months ago we were looking for a sort of painful U-shaped recovery, which is going to take some time. Now I think we're looking for a V-shaped recovery. Markets are forward looking. I think they're looking to the other side of that chasm. Yeah. We have got a chasm to get over. But I think that's where markets right. are taking some inspiration. One, two, you know, markets are not economies. I mean, these stock markets are very long duration, you know, big tech, defensives. Uh, that's what's going to do well here with right. lower inflation, lower bond yields. It's the real economy, which is not particularly well represented in the stock market, that's going to take the sort of here right. and now pain of these tightening financial conditions. Right, ben, I thought of you this weekend when I saw the new concentration in Microsoft and Apple. I think Lizanne Saunders over at Schwab was highlighting uh, that. Ben, we've been here before. What is different this time about the concentration in cash flow persistent giants like Microsoft and Apple? So what do you look for in this environment? You look for things that have you know, lots of cash, fortress balance sheets, high profit margins, defensive businesses. Now, yeah, you've got the traditional defensives, but you've also got big tech. And what else do you look for? You look for those long duration assets that benefit from lower or at least capped bond yields. Uh, and that's tech and that's traditional defensive. So I think they tick all the boxes and the things that are going to hurt here are the more cyclical assets, the ones that, you know, where earnings are going to fall faster than we thought. So, you know, commodities, um, you know, cyclicals. You know, so I, yeah, so I, I think I, you, you still own the market. You just own maybe different things than you were owning a few months ago. At least at the heart of this in crisis, and let's agree we're still in crisis, is index versus active. And then how, how narrow is active? That seems to be the debate. Well, and to Ben's point, and this has sort of been the counterintuitive feature of what we've seen over the past month, is that tech has outperformed. We have seen this again and again this year, even after everyone said this would be the big area of underperformance. How much can we count on rates being perhaps a bit lower than some projections perhaps earlier in this year as <clears throat> boosting these stocks versus questions around whether the valuations are still too high in an era of slower growth? And and, uh, lower multiples. I, I think that works for them. In, in a world of no growth, if you have some growth, and I still think there's this underlying tech adoption story, which continues to give them uh, a decent growth runway, people are going to pay for that. And I also don't find the valuations particularly, um, particularly demanding. I mean, it's a massive derating uh, last year. And I, again, I think that, um, that long-term growth profile, the fortress balance sheets, I think they're all worth paying for. Clearly, there are you know differences within tech. It's a big uh, it's a big universe. But I think those big tech names on you know around twenty times earnings, I actually find the reasonably good value. How much are you watching, Ben? The idea that we're here, seeing Tim Cook go over to China to talk about business, that you are seeing increased rhetoric between the U.S. and China when it comes to a lot of technology. I'm thinking about uh, TikTok last week. How concerned are you about how that could affect valuations going forward if that pressured some of the international businesses? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a risk. It's Think about semis, it's nearly a third of, of the semis market, and, and clearly this isn't helping. That's going to be shaving off, uh, shaving off some of that growth. But again, you know, we're talking about less tech earnings, you know, problems with China. I mean, we could have had this conversation, you know, six, nine, 12 months ago. I mean, I have to hope that um, quite a lot of that's in the price. What's, you know, what's new here, I think, is the accelerated growth slowdown 
the decline in bond yields. That's what I think we're um, you know, resetting for. And I, I do think that's positive for you know, traditional defensives and big tech. Ben, tell me about buying Europe right now. I was on the phone this morning with our Stephen Aarons encyclopedic on the improvements we've seen over 24 months at Deutsche Bank. And he's working, folks. You're going to see Mr. Aarons with stories here from Bloomberg, from Frankfurt uh, through the morning. Ben, not so much on DBK, but for a guy like you with your London heritage, what's the opportunity in European banking stocks challenged? So Europe is very different from the U.S., you know, both good and bad. On the good side, I think European banks have more capital. I think they're more tightly regulated. I think they have better liquidity. Uh, and, and I think a lot of this is just because, you know, the Eurozone crisis was, was, was uh, you know, uh, more recent than the, the global financial crisis. That's the good news. The bad news is, um, you know, if a bank does go down in, 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 in the European Union, the impact is going to be much, much greater than it is in, in the U.S. Loans to GDP in the U.S., 50 percent. Loans to GDP in Europe are, are twice that. Uh, you know, European companies borrow from their banks. U.S. Right. companies don't borrow from their banks. They borrow from the bond market. So, you know, I'm reasonably relaxed. I, you know, you've also got, you know, Europe has so far has had much better earnings momentum. We saw that in the fourth quarter, has much lower valuations. You know, growth has been sort of firming up. So, you know, all that's good. But just sort of keep at the back of your mind yeah. here. If we do get that worst case scenario, which I don't think we're going to get, just to be clear, but if we do get it, um, you know, the, 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 the shoe goes to the other foot. You know, Europe's much more exposed. <clears throat> ben Laidler, thank you so much for getting us started on this week of uh, interesting news, to say the least. Benjamin Laidler is with eToro. Is, well, PCE deflator, whatever, later this week? I mean, yeah. I, I guess we're all, day, you know, forgetting about, you know, FRC and the banks and all that. The answer is we're still where we were a month ago. We're hanging on inflation data, right? Well, this is going to be important. The BC deflator <clears throat> is what the Fed looks at, and they clearly are still concerned about inflation. They're clearly still willing to hike well, rates at a time where they're not seeing the progress they were hoping for. We are seeing a lot here. A headline just out on a merger in education finance. We'll give that to you here in a moment as we go to break. On the equity markets, Ben Layler, we continue strong in the 7 o'clock hour. Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The failed Silicon Valley Bank, Valley, Valley Bank has a new owner. North Carolina-based First Citizens Bank shares will buy about $72 billion of SVP's assets at a discount of $16.5 billion. Now, as part of the deal, the FDIC will get stock appreciation rights in First Citizens worth up to $500 million. Authorities took extraordinary measures to shore up confidence in the financial system after Silicon Valley Bank collapsed. In Israel, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is considering a delay in his judicial overhaul plan after a night of enraged demonstrations. Now thousands took to the streets after Netanyahu fired his defense minister for criticizing his plan to reduce the power of the Supreme Court. Meanwhile, Israel's main trade union launched a strike affecting departures from the international airport. Ukraine is demanding a meeting of the U.N. Security Council on Vladimir Putin's announcement on nuclear weapons. Putin says that Russia will place tactical nuclear arms in Belarus. The value of a Security Council meeting is unclear since Russia could veto any resolution or action that's proposed. North Korea has test-fired two more ballistic missiles, adding to a recent barrage of launches. Kim Jong-un's regime had no immediate comment. The launch came as the U.S. and South Korea conducted their largest amphibious exercise in about five years. And Twitter is looking for whoever leaked parts of its proprietary source code. The code was posted on GitHub, the widely used code repository that's now owned by Microsoft. GitHub complied with Twitter's request to remove the data, but Twitter now wants it to identify anyone who posted, downloaded, or uploaded its code. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. I'm wondering whether you would be open to assisting further if there was another call for additional liquidity from Credit Suisse. The answer is absolutely not, for many reasons, outside the simplest reason, which is regulatory and statutory. We now own 
um, 9.8% of the bank. If we go above 10%, all kinds of new rules kick in. There is a certitude in the voice of the interview of the year for Bloomberg Television already this early in the year, Youssef Gamal al-Din. They're changing the world and particularly changing the Swiss world with a conversation with the Saudi National Bank chairman. Lisa, I want to pause here. I had the privilege of aerospace engineering with uh, Ruth Rebecca Struick and the others at the University of Colorado when this gentleman was at George Washington. And there was a huge contingent of Arab royalty, Persian Gulf royalty, in our engineering classes developing that certitude. We know what we're talking about. I'm as guilty of that every day as, as anyone. And this poor guy got run over as a civil engineer from George Washington University not thinking about the ramifications of certitude. And the news of this morning is that Amar al Qudari, who is the chair of the Saudi National yeah. Bank, resigned after making those comments as head of the Saudi, Nas Saudi National Bank. Right. Evidently, it's expected that this bank will have lost a billion dollars on their investment in Credit Suisse or potentially uh, that much. So, this is the problem right now is that we're looking right. at a situation where people are trying to autopsy how much that interview with Bloomberg Television and yeah. Yusuf really led to to some of these concerns. Did you see over the weekend that one of the, the Swiss authorities said that Credit Suisse wouldn't have lasted another day? Uh, yeah, I, I read those articles very carefully. I thought the Financial Times did a great job uh, summarizing as well. And I would say it's still ongoing. What struck me there, and we've got to move on here to American banking, but 70 plus percent of the Swiss people are really not happy with this transaction. <laughs> On every level. This is also the <clears throat> yeah. banking capital of the world. That's where yeah. their claim to fame is. So it's a pretty big uh, it's a pretty big black eye for a lot of people. We're going to bounce across the Atlantic today, back and forth and back and forth. And now we go to the Atlantic, to the northern climes of Maine. And Gerard Cassidy, he's been such an advantage to us with RBC Capital Markets on the banks. Is it all quiet on the Cassidy front today, Gerard? I mean, are we beyond the crisis? I don't buy it for a minute. Uh, Tom, I think the quiet, the crisis has really quieted down. And I think as the deposit flight has pretty much, I think we're going to find by the end of this week, uh, slowed down to a trickle. You know, the numbers came out, as you probably saw late last week, um, and the deposit outflow from the smaller banks um, was not that material. <laughs> it was less than 2%. Um, it was far less than I think some of the um, folks were thinking. Uh, and therefore, it, it is calming down. And you saw, of course, that Silicon Valley, um, the FDIC was able to sell that to, over the weekend to First Citizens. So both of the failed banks have now been sold to private banks or banks that are publicly traded. So we're moving in the right direction. Is it the all clear signal, Tom? Probably not, but we're getting darn close. Do you think, Gerard, that the calls for deposit insurance on a more generalized scale were overblown over the past few weeks, that the need for that kind of backstop and certainty was overstated? Lisa, thank you for saying that. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I think what people are finding out is that most depositors have confidence in their banks. And that being said, when you break down the size of our banks, less than 100 million in assets or less than 10 billion in assets, the majority of those deposits in those banks are already insured by the government because they're less than $250,000. That doesn't mean they may not look at a revision of lifting up the deposit insurance levels at some point, but I think it was, to your point, overblown and overhyped. <laughs> and that was part of this whole problem was, unfortunately, it spread like wildfire on social media. And I think that's one of the biggest issues that has to be a addressed as we go forward. So there's a conflation here. On one hand, you have the potential for bank runs, right? And that was something that really spurred the immediate kind of concern. But then there's this question of just deposit flight, that a lot of people are withdrawing their money from banking accounts just generally in order to go into money market funds and other higher interest paying uh, rates. And this is the issue, because you're seeing small banks, according to the data, lose deposits at a much faster clip than larger banks. So at what point is that the real problem? It's a profitability problem and it's a com competition problem as well as a lending one i i would say that the mix is changing to your point uh, when you look at the uh, data from the uh, federal reserve you'll notice that something what they refer to as other deposits which are generally the non-interest bearing or low interest bearing deposits have fallen more aggressively both for the large banks and small banks since rates have started <clears throat> to go higher 
What they've replaced that with, though, is time deposits. So CDs that, you know, Tom might remember back in the 80s. No, no, you no. Could get a, <laughs> you could get a CD for, you know, 13% <laughs> for 12 months. Um, the, those, those types of instruments are coming back. And believe it or not, Lisa, back in the 1980s, 50% of bank funding was with CDs. As of the fourth quarter, it was less than 10%. Yeah. Well, so I the mix is changing. What I remember about the 1980s, Gerard Cassidy, is you had a haircut and a beard like Bob Seger. That's what I really <laughs> I remember there. You know, the, the, the smartest tweet this weekend was from the giant of Chicago, Jim Bianco, where he said, look, it's a 5% world. Everybody get over it. How does the profitability of, of the RBC capital market stocks you follow, how does the profitability change in Bianco's 5% world? Tom, it really comes down to, once again, the mix of deposits. And for the banks who've been working very hard and diligently, you know, for the last 20 years and growing those cheap core consumer deposits, the 5% world is very profitable. Uh, what investors, they know now, but six right. months ago, people weren't looking at the right side of a bank's balance sheet. That, that was 15 years ago when rates were higher. But when you have checking account deposits of consumers and they're basically the consumer's operating account, banks don't need to pay any interest <laughs> on it because the benefits right. they're giving to the consumer are obviously the ease of use and as well as making payments, et cetera. Oh. So the point is in a 5% world, if you have the right deposit mix, like a Brian Morningham over at Bank America, this is very profitable for a company okay, like that. Let's get a window here into the world, a, cut, a cutthroat world of securities analysis and banking. Keith Horowitz at Citigroup, Gerard. I mean, you know Keith's work suspect. Oh, we yeah. all know that. He goes out and he puts a buy today on M&T of Buffalo, the best-run bank uh, in America. I'm not editorializing there. Gerard, you've got a moonshot on MTB. What will be the catalyst for Horowitz's strong buy and your strong buy on MTB to, to work out? How do you get the moonshot on a Buffalo bank? It, it, exactly for that reason, Tom. You want the slow growth, steady eddies that are, <laughs> that are funded by these cheap core deposits. MNT is probably has one of the best deposit bases. They have the grandma and grandpa deposit up in Watertown, New York, that has $5,000 in it. That money is not moving to Marcus. And as a result, they don't need to pay up for it. But second, you also have a company that never extended its duration like its peers in its securities portfolio. And therefore, they're earning far more in that portfolio. And then third, you might remember, Tom, they closed on the people's uh, acquisition just over a year ago. And the cost savings from that acquisition will also drive earnings. So they are three drivers. And then lastly, they have one of the few banks that has excess capital. They've been a great a steward of shareholders' uh, um, capital, and they're going to return the well, excess capital through buybacks. Gerard, we, we got to leave it there. Hugely beneficial. Lisa's right now to buy ticket on Fortress Wilmers right now. Gerard Cassidy with RBC Capital Marks. I mean, this is what about we're in crisis. What is the intellectual framework to do something to provide action within the crisis? And that's what Cassidy and the wonderful Keith Horowitz over at Citigroup and others are doing. Well, there's a distinction between a banking crisis versus a profitability story. And that distinction has been really hard to tease out. It's sort of this question <laughs> of how profitable can you be lending at a time where it's more difficult to attract some of those cheap yeah. deposits? You talk about 5% world being highly profitable. For which banks? How sticky are their assets? These are some of the valuation uh, analyses that people are trying to do to come up with a framework for what's a buy and what's a sell. I, to me, Lisa, and, and you know, Gerard's making jokes at me. He remembers me wanting to run uh, Boston when it was 9 and 10 percent CDs. We're just at the beginning of this reframe from no interest rates to tangible interest rates. And... A lot of people are getting used to this, including swashbuckling Silicon Valley bankers. Are we going to get toasters? May they rest in peace. Toasters or? Yeah, know. we're going to get toast. We're going back to green stamps, folks. <laughs> Stay with us. Bloomberg Surveillance.
Covered surveillance, Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramlett's and Tom King. Mr. Farrell on assignment through, is it all the week? or no, is he through Wednesday. He'll be back on Thursday. Through Wednesday? That's my understanding. One of my interns talked to his people, and it was, you know, I thought he was going to be here when I got back. I was going to wear my beige suit and, you know, bust his chops at a maximum level. It's a three-island tour, and... Uh, now I find out John's out for three days. What's that about? The man from Del Monte was supposed to come back. Yes, and, he, was. Know, he, he was. You know, full my, display my instead. Stylist, <laughs> my stylist said, Tom, you're rushing a season. But, A, for those of you on radio, I'm still on the Three Island Tour. It was very nice. And major shout-out to the people that assisted uh, on the way to the depths of the Caribbean. It was yeah. it was heavy you're, lifting you're in the, as well. Uh, you were in the jungle. Well, while you were in the jungle and uh, experiencing uh, the beach and calm, there was anything but in the markets. And one thing that people were really trying to reprice was this <clears throat> idea of rate cuts in the face of increased tightening in credit conditions just by virtue of banks having less funding. Are, are adults in, of institutions talking about rate cuts. I yes. think it's just a parlor game. A lot I, I of don't... people, well, a lot of people are talking about that and saying yeah. that the Fed's wrong. They're going to have to cut rates because of some of this inherent tightening. And Winthrop yeah. had this interesting kind of question around that. He waited, uh, he weighed in on it, basically saying, when Winthrop of uh, Brown Brothers Harriman, near-term policymakers will remain cautious, but I think that the banking sector crisis is not a regulatory issue, is a regulatory issue, excuse me, not a monetary policy issue. As a result, I think the central banks continue hiking this year even though markets are pricing in easing cycles this year. And that really is, if you want to use the word parlor game, the real question underpinning so much investment, Tom. It's very fluid right now and continuing fluid through the week. Again, Stephen Aarons in Frankfurt observing European banking, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Adam Posen will join us in the 8 o'clock hour with his most important essay of the weekend. Right now, Dr. Thin joins us. Win Thin is global head of currency strategy at Brown Brothers Harriman, and far more than that, a student of the Pacific Rim. When what do you glean if 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 it's not monetary policy but regulatory policy regulatory policy is this crisis what do you glean about the new economic slowdown and that China may miss the mark on 6% economic growth? Yes, I, first of all good morning guys. Thanks for having me. Um so you know this past year the, the two main drivers have been Fed policy and China COVID zero and reopening. And we got everyone got pulled up on the, the China reopening store, but really the data since then have really been yeah it's very disappointing. Um, you know the, the official PMI for March will come out later this week, expected to show a significant drop. And if you look at the export and export order numbers out of China, <laughs> Korea, Taiwan, they've just been really just a blip. Uh, and so you know it seems like it, this China's going to struggle. You know I, I call it the year of living dangerously for President Xi. It's it's going to struggle to I think to meet even the five percent growth target that's set. Uh, what does that mean? It means global growth is is it going to remain under pressure. And China's not the savior. Uh, we know that the U.S. is slowing. We know pretty much the whole world is slowing. So, so the, to me, the big investment punchline I got is that is is to I remain uh, negative on emerging markets. Right? We need strong global growth and abundant global liquidity for emerging markets. Right. So the sweet spot of the cycle. We're not getting that. Uh, I'd say it's a 2024 story for EM. Not a long-term EM bull, obviously, but. It's a cyclical play. Right now, the cycle is working against EM. Well, to your work out of Columbia and on to Brown Brothers Harriman, then, in currencies is the litmus paper, the indicator of all of this. Is the distinction here that you're stable dollar, or could you even surprise and say strong dollar? I, I believe the sell-off in the, in the dollar is a bit overdone. Um, we, you're, you were talking about the, the rate cuts being priced in. Right now, the market's still pricing in three rate cuts from the Fed by year end. I just don't think that's happening. Obviously, Mr. Powell does not believe that either. Um, you know, but you know, markets are obviously trading on fear and panic. But uh, in that regard, once those rate cuts are taken out of the market, which I believe they will be, um, then I think the dollar can get another leg up higher. And we've seen the expectations of the ECB and the Bank of England kind of come back. No more rate cuts uh, priced for them, believe it or not. They were, they were priced in last week. So again, it's, it's, it's a, as you mentioned, it's a very fluid situation. But I remain confident that the the, 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 the risks of a Fed cut in 2023 are, are really, really low. I, I, well, I really just can't make up you know a story that that can happen. When I want to pick up on what you just said, that we're driving, uh, we're being driven by fear and panic, not by fundamentals. And the inflationary picture points to something that's very different for rate hikes or potential rate cuts as the market is pricing in. 
That said, a lot of people are talking about the natural credit tightening that emerges from some of these smaller banks losing deposits or having some funding pressures. How do you push back against that, that this basically accelerates some of the credit tightening, does the work for the Federal Reserve, and takes the pressure off them in order to get inflation under control faster? No, Lisa, I think that's a perfectly valid point. In fact, Mr. Powell made that point uh, during his press conference. He said a large majority of the FOMC committee thought that this would result in credit tightening that could less than the need for, for further tightening. So that's, it's, obviously that is a, a distinct possibility. I think my only point is that it doesn't take, let the Fed off totally off the hook. You know, I think the U.S. economy remains pretty resilient. I think the consensus, your, your Bloomberg consensus for jobs is uh, in March, I think 225K. Still, you know, in normal times, that would be a stellar report. <clears throat> obviously now it's kind of slowing from, you know, a very elevated uh, levels. But, you know, I do think that um, we'll also get the PCE uh, and core PCE later this week. It just seems that inflation is much more stubborn. Now, I've said this many times on this show before. Is like, you know, the easy part for the Fed is getting from inflation from eight percent down to four percent. The hard part and the painful part is getting from four percent to two percent. Right. And that's you know we're sort of entering that era, that 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 sort of period. And I think the Fed is pretty resolute. We're looking away, you know, sort of beyond the banking sector. You know, I think the, the central banks. To me, the big takeaway from last week, from all the major central banks, is hey, listen, we're still tightening. We're a little cautious because of, of the unknown impact of the banking sector. We're still tightening. So they bought themselves some time. We don't have a ECB uh, meeting until, I think, May 4th. FOMC is May 3rd. Bank of England is uh, maybe a week later, I think. So they bought themselves some time. I, it's hard for me to, to see this, this banking crisis lasting, you know, another month and a half. I think at this point, at that point, uh, you know, we may get the all clear to, to actually continue hiking. When I, I want to take your holistic view here, and I want to bounce off the work of Dominic Constant at Mizuho right now, who was the first one I heard with the phrase super restrictive, which is not just calculations off the Bloomberg, but an entire macro structure of inflation flows, the LM curve, the IS curve and such. How close are we to Constant super restrictive right now? Well, that, uh, to me, you know, policy, sort of the optimal policy rate is, is, is a moving target. Uh, and it's hard to pin down. We all talk about you know, real rates. Uh, we've got, you know, nominal rates, you know, somewhere just around 5%. But, you know, inflation is the moving target, inflation expectations. So, to me, I don't think we're super restrictive yet. If you look at the Fed's, the Chicago Fed has a monetary conditions index. Um, comes out weekly. Uh, it's starting to tighten a little bit, but we're still much looser um, than I think the Fed wants to be. You know, this, this is, again, a moving target. Financial conditions will continue to tighten. But we're, I, to me, if you look at the numbers and the, the, the economic numbers, the financial condition numbers, we're, we're nowhere near the sort of really, really restrictive. We are definitely in the approaching the restrictive territory. Um, but is that enough to get inflation down, say, from 4% to 2%? That's, that's the million-dollar question. And again, I, I don't envy the Fed. You know, we already had the supply chain, the pandemic. Now they've got, you know, banking, banking crisis sort of to, to worry about. But again, and by the way, thank you for using my quote, but I do firmly believe that it's, it's really a regulatory failure more than a banking sector failure. And again, I'm going to draw this full circle. To me, low rates were the cause of these problems, not the, not, uh, uh, not, not the uh, savior. Yeah. But cutting rates back to zero is, 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 is absolutely the wrong thing to do. It's just going to add to the excess risk taking, et cetera, et cetera. So... Unfortunately, I think that we're going to have to kind of sort of, you know, really uh, grit our teeth and, and and get through this. And I think we will. I Very. think banking sectors are resilient. I think I think we can we can do the job here. Very few people are, are talking about rates going back to zero percent, and I think that that really is the crux of the question, right? Where do we end up? I do want to, though, uh, speak to your expertise on this holistic kind of cross current of the world and going to China and the supposed boom that we were going to get from China's reopening, this idea that that was going to spur even potentially more growth if not uh, disinflation because of the production that would come back online. It hasn't been such an optimistic story because growth has underperformed. How does that play into your expectations of the ongoing momentum if we don't have that China impulse coming through to the degree that people thought? Well, I think the silver lining behind that cloud is that the um, sort of disinflation forces will remain intact, right? Because there's always the fear China comes online, all of a sudden copper prices surge, oil prices surge. But you, you see, I think the opposite has happened in the last couple of weeks. Uh, partially, obviously, due to the, the banking crisis, but we've, we have had a series of soft data readings out of, out of China. So I think in net-net, um, yes, it's obviously negative for global growth, but the good news, again, the <clears> silver <throat> lining, is that, that, that maybe that we get these disinflationary forces will continue. Yeah. Um, but again, I just don't think the markets can, can count on China to be the savior of, of global growth this year. It's just 
Um, it's, it's, it's much more uh, domestic, inward looking. Uh, it's really trying to become much more self sufficient, not sort of keep <clears throat> into the whole global export chain and all that, et cetera, et cetera. So, I personally, I think the other countries are right in trying to find alternative supply chains. You know, we know that Mexico is going to benefit right. from some other regional um, economies. Winston, thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Thin is with Brown Brothers Harriman there with a global and holistic view of really a financial system in crisis on this movement in rates. We've been remiss. We're at 6.39 in the morning right now. And, Lisa, we really haven't done the scorecard on the Good Monday news of regional banking in America. It obviously leads to the poster child First Republic up large, up 25 percent at one point, basically a 12 to 16 move on First Republic. In a single sentence, which I think over the weekend was missed by many, First Citizens, they're going to buy SVB. So there is there is action here in a yelling friendly way is how I would put it this morning. Well, they finally completed a sale. It was clear that there was some concern over why the FDIC delayed it. Was there just no bidder? There was clearly a bidder, so that uh, I think uh, definitely gave people confidence. There also, though, was a feeling that there was a little bit more transparency, perhaps, around the idea that First Republic could exist for a longer period of time. This is what regulators came out. I will <coughs> say Deutsche Bank shares also rebounding after yes. being lower and under pressure last week, up about 5% over in Germany, how much of this is a larger issue of people just saying, okay, maybe we threw the baby out with the bathwater and weren't trading well, more on, uh, to Wynn's point, fear rather than In my than call with Steve Ahrens this morning in Frankfurt, we spent half the call on cultural differences between Germany and Switzerland, and for that matter, the individualistic United States where it's every depositor for themselves. I think that was the phrase that was used by Franklin. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the basic idea here is these are hugely cultural. And Steve Ahrens emphasized to me that German people, as, as a general statement, stay put with their loyalty and their deposit. There's less deposit flight risk generally in Europe based on the structure of certain investments. Yeah. At that same time, Deutsche Bank has done a lot to get itself into regulatory shape. I mean, it's basically a different uh, profile than it was, you know, I, I 10 years ago. I just figured it out. Oh, God. Uh, uh, Dr. O'Larian, thank you so much for bringing this to my attention. The coach of the tots was canned and Pharaoh's not in. Correlation? I think it's correlation. Yeah. I don't know. Or causation. It, Is we'll he going to be the next coach? You think so? Bloomberg Surveillance, good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Silicon Valley Bank branches will open under a new name today. The FDIC says First Citizens Bank Shares has agreed to buy the failed lender more than two weeks after its collapse. The North Carolina-based firm will purchase all of their deposits and about $72 billion of SVB's loans at a discount of $16.5 billion. Now, some $90 billion in securities will remain in receivership. Credit Suisse faces the threat of a possible investigation and disciplinary action over how top managers ran the bank in the lead up to its collapse. Switzerland's banking regulator told a Swiss newspaper that officials are considering options. She says Credit Suisse had a cultural problem that led to a lack of accountability. The UK's independent public spending forecaster says the country's economy is 4% smaller because of Brexit. The chairman of the Office for Budget Responsibility, Richard Hughes, told the BBC that was similar to the impact caused by the coronavirus pandemic. The UK is the only developed economy not to have recovered to pre-COVID levels of GDP growth. China's economic recovery was mixed in March. Business confidence and the housing market improved. But according to Bloomberg's latest index of eight early indicators, falling car sales and weak global demand drags on the economy. And Salesforce has reached an agreement with activist investor Elliott Investment Management, which will not go ahead with a plan to nominate directors. Elliott's multi-billion stake in the software maker became public in January, and it put forward a slate of directors. Salesforce has been under pressure as revenue growth has slowed. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
What's unclear for us is how much of these banking stresses are leading to a widespread credit crunch. And then that credit crunch, you're right, just as you said, would then slow down the economy. This is something we are monitoring very, very closely. The aerospace engineer from Minneapolis, Neil Kashkari, Fed president for Minneapolis there, driving the story forward. Lisa, help me here quickly with speakers today. Schnabel of Germany. Uh, uh, Bailey, uh, Bailey of, of, of England, England, and then... Jefferson, uh, Fed governor, back uh, in the end of the day. And let me guess, yet. 14 more tomorrow. That's we get probably, a lot of speakers yeah. and very little clarity, because I don't really understand what they could possibly say that might give us a more better well, sense of what they're going to do. Again, if you're just joining us here on radio and television, it's simple. American banks up today. I think we can state that with futures up 23 uh, even Bitcoin up fractionally, rounded up to 28,000. Two's 10 spread disinverts. It comes in a little bit. I've even got $70 West Texas Intermediate crisis over. <laughs> there's a lot of signs <laughs> that there's a bit of calming. It'll take more than one day as people take a look at, yeah. uh, you know, potential other jitters. But that said, there is yeah. definitely a feeling of calm. Somebody noticed my cough. Yeah, I have a little bit of the plague. You know, we were on the cruise. And it was a three island tour. Ginger gave me, you know, it's not COVID, but Ginger gave me, you know, something. Ginger on the Ginger, cruise? Did yeah, you on the do cruise. the like uh, was... Macarena? No, I did not do no, no, Gilligan did the Macarena. <laughs> Joining us now, and this is really important and timely because it has been removed from the banking crisis, removed from our world, but it's not. It is France and Israel. Tina Fordham joins us now, founder, geopolitical strategist, Fordham Global uh, Foresight. Tina, I have been dying to talk to you about this. I understand in France, and I want to get to that in a minute, you know, the Sixth Republic and what Mr. Macron's going to do. But the images from Israel over the weekend were stunning. I interpolated the extrapolation. Tina, it's as if 22 million people were protesting in America. Who are these people, Tina Fordham? Thanks, Tom. And I, I wish I could hear more about Gilligan's Island and if the professor and Marianne were there, too. Um, and uh, I like the beard. Uh, yes, big protests over the weekend. Uh, we, we're back to a period of Vox Populi risk, uh, you know, flames. My outlook this year is called firewalking. But as you say, markets um, have been very much focused on the, the crises in the banking sector, what it means for Fed policy. And the reason to take a look at these protests from a financial markets standpoint is whether or not there are transmission mechanisms and what's behind them. And I think one of the things that market participants tend to not be very good at is understanding the root causes and the interlinkages between these things. So you ask, who are the protesters in, in Israel, um, a tiny country uh, in which a huge proportion of the population is not only protesting, um, but uh, going on a, a national strike today, in light of what is called a judicial coup. Bibi Netanyahu's proposed reforms amount to the um, executive branch of government right. neutralizing the judiciary as, as if Congress um, could overtake the Supreme Court. You have a, like with all big protests, you've got segments of the Israeli population coming together. If it was one right. group, then it would be a flash in the pan. The staying power here is that secular Israelis, as well as the defense um, uh, sort of reservists, as well as the defense minister himself, who was sacked <clears throat> last night, uh, urban types, right. let's say, the tech sector, which is the driver of the Israeli tiger economy, are coming together to say, no, this is anti-democratic. And so it is really quite existential for a country that is often referred to as the only true democracy in the Middle East. Right. And we haven't thought about Israel for quite a long time. It's, well, there's the point, Tina. And my demarcation of my life is not Sadat and the rest. It is the assassination of Rabin in 1995. That is my demarcation between the old Israel of our childhoods and the new Israel. Are we at another demarcation point like we were with that assassination 30-some years ago? I think so, unless Netanyahu and his supporters do more than pause, which is the easiest thing to do, and actually climb down. 
Um, I don't think Israeli society is going to tolerate these so-called reforms. Um, people have fought too hard and the state of Israel uh, means too much. We've been seeing not only protests in Israel, but also in France and of a different nature. They're sort of more populist in nature, but there feels like there are these fissures that are emerging in some of the stalwart democracies of the world as people try to understand the correct path forward, whether it's what's going on in Israel and undermining the judiciary or if it's in France, where uh, people are protesting the increase in the retirement age and wages. How much do you see this percolating into something larger that perhaps could affect markets, that could affect what we understand in terms of alliances as well as uh, just the wage pressures that are emerging? It's a really important question, Lisa. And um, the, the French protests, I mean, you know, the, the sort of American stereotype was always the French don't want to work. Re raising the retirement age from 62 to 64 is something that Emmanuel Macron campaigned upon um, because, as we all know, we, we are living in graying and uh, kind of shrinking economies where there aren't enough workers in the demographic pyramid. Um, but it isn't just the sort of the requirement to, to work longer that's getting the French out in the streets. If we want to try to connect it to this wider kind of Vox Populi resurgence, it's also the fact that uh, Macron is resented for um, you know, being perceived to ram this change through uh, and um, to do it without uh, wider support in, in the French parliament. Um, what is at stake here is, in my view, if we kind of link it back to the, the wobble that we had here in the UK, which wasn't about protests, but also involved the pension sector, is the extent to which taking away fundamental rights or a public perception that that's happening, um, particularly when it comes to pensions, is uh, an electrified third rail. And so with that in mind, I take issue a bit with your previous speaker, although I know what he meant when he said markets are reacting with fear and panic and not fundamentals. Pensions and constitutional rights are fundamentals. They're political fundamentals. Our task is try to understand when they feed into markets. Tina Fordham of Fordham Global Foresight, thank you so much for being with us. It's an important moment, especially given all of the tensions that we see, and it's not just what we're seeing with respect to traditional democracies and the interconnectedness oh. of, uh, you know, kind of what we've seen in the wage pressures to some of the fissures that we've seen in traditional democracies. But there's this sort of existential overhang right. of what's been going on with Ukraine as yeah, well. Yeah, what's so important here, and this is really, really something we're going to focus on here through the summer. We're, of course, attending Washington, the meetings of the World Bank and the International uh, Monetary Fund, all sorts of good plans for that with good people. But I don't want to over civics this. I don't want to go, you know, full Richard Haas, I mean, you know, to, to, to Ambassador Haas. I, I, you know, we don't want to go full Richard Haas <laughs> here, but the linkages are there for example, in France, and this is with John Fenby's great work over the years, the Fifth Republic in 1958. I was in Paris in 68 when de Gaulle started really falling apart, when it, when it began to fall to pieces, and they picked up the pieces. And so people like Tina Fordham are talking about the revolution of a Sixth Republic, or they're talking about, is this going to be a sea change if Netanyahu doesn't back down? And to me, it all links in to the tensions of the financial system, the Chris Whalen financial system moving from low rates out to this new regime that we used to know years ago. Well, and I think that we're shifting from a regime of low inflation into one of higher inflation. That's what a lot of people have said. More whether persistent. that's right, more persistent. coming up today, yeah. So at what point does that pressure some <clears throat> of the traditional oversight, the traditional sort of democratic uh, structures of nations that were governed and sort of on autopilot a little bit more for those years of a more stasis kind of economic backdrop? I mean, you think about wage pressures. We're seeing this even in the UK. We've been talking talking about that. That used to be an area where you did not see strikes like you saw in France, and now you are seeing strikes like you used to see more traditionally in France. Right. How much is this really a result of people really feeling the erosion of their spending power in an era of incredibly high inflation and making demands no. that they just haven't made with a certain, uh, you know, just visceral angst? Distant, distant past, if we'd gone to Davos, I was going to call it something like the Davos zombie roll-up. But my theme for the year, and I stand with this, is 2023, the great zombie roll-up. 
and I didn't see any of this coming, including the international uh, relation events. This is ongoing. I, at least I'm in the camp. It's not going away, even if we do solve the American banking crisis. I think a lot of people would agree, and that's what we're seeing right <clears throat> now with the reason why there's all of the volatility is people price out the unknown. Farrell, before he left on a three-day uh, uh, island cruise, a three-island, three-day cruise, put together a great set of guests for you. Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley soon. This is Bloomberg. Inflation's coming down, but we don't think it's going to come down quite as fast as markets are pricing in. I think inflation's really dying out quick right now, but I think it's probably got another leg up. I don't think we've licked the inflation problem, and so that's why we're not anticipating that the Fed's going to cut rates. They are still fighting inflation. They are still dealing with their core mandate. If we listen to Chair Powell, effectively he was saying, we can't really give you forward guidance at the moment. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramlitz, and Tom Keen on a Monday after an historic week. I wasn't here. John Farrell's not here today. He is on a serious assignment here uh, for three days. You know, we'll see. I think it's, you know, looking into my new beard and all that. People are saying, should I keep the beard? And on radio, it's a, it's a thoughtful process. You're lucky you're on radio. But it's Lisa and I here on a day after crisis. With all your work, Lisa, last week with John, which was, I heard all around the world the anecdotes about what you two were doing, the special broadcast on Sunday, the Fed show, the exhausting week than it was. Why should it continue this week? I mean, are you in for another week of this or do you pause? I think everyone's a little tired. <clears throat> and by the way, you were missed. I think that right now what we're looking at is an exhaustion taking over a market with no new information. I mean, basically, the yeah. fact that there was no new information is information. It's basically telling you the fact that <clears throat> there hasn't been another failure, there hasn't been another rumor, there hasn't been another weak link that's been pointed out is a fantastic sign. And people are rallying behind that. And you can see that. Markets They're today. rallying in the equity markets as well. SPX futures up uh, six tenths of a percent. Nasdaq lags a little. We'll see where that juggernaut goes. The VIX 21.68. And of course, the lift here is in the banking stocks, which I think uh, says all. Oh, First Republic Bank has been a challenge as well, lifting nicely from a 12 level up to 16 with a lot of other three and four percent moves as well. Is it all clear for Secretary Yellen? I'm not there. <laughs> well, I, there was an article that I read over the weekend that I loved. <laughs> that really highlighted how they don't want to overpromise measures that are going to be deemed unnecessary after this wave of panic ends, but they want to create uh, just this feeling of support for banks. So how do they toe that line when they're not proposing policies? They don't know what they don't know, right? They don't know how far this can go. And that was the confusion of last week. If we don't get any more failures... Are we in the all clear, to your point? Do we get the sense that we don't need to really focus on Janet Yellen right. anymore for a possible <clears throat> emergency rescue or bail-in or whatever you want to call it? And if that's the case, it gives people a feeling of stability underpinned by this idea that we've still seen hot inflation data and hot and robust economic data. I mean, I, I'm going to look, Lisa, at the BTMM screen, as we discussed in the last hour, and I thought Jim Bianco's comment here, I don't know, Chart Banner, if you've got it in the control room, but Mr. Bianco, with my short tweet of the weekend, it wasn't like one of his six-page opuses. It's like Exodus in the Old, Tempest, uh, Old Testament when Jim Bianco writes, and this was just simple. It's a 5% world. It's well, just that simple. It's 5% world. But for how long? And this, just to go <clears throat> for what happened last week that still has remained in the market, you take a look at what rates are expected to be in January of 2024, less right. than 4 percent. So that is more than a percentage point of rate cuts from May through January of next year that's being priced into markets regardless of the stability that people are seeing in the banking system. We're going to truncate the data check. We've got an important guest to start this 7 o'clock hour strong on radio. On television, two-year yield 3.93 percent. We're still under 4 percent, but that's constructive. A lot of constructive tone out there with disinversion still under play. The real yield 1.21 uh, percent. Again, I'm going to go to uh, SPX up 24. Lisa, what's your world look like? What does the spread market look like over the weekend and to well, start? Well, what you've seen is really spread widening, <clears throat> particularly in the riskier credit. There is a feeling that perhaps you've got to price in more default risk when it comes to high-yield bonds. But otherwise, it's calm. 
that come is what people are pointing to right. for a reason to support some of the construction. Just want to give you a sense of what we're watching today. Please. At 11 a.m., we hear from ECB executive board member Isabel Schnabel. She's going to be speaking at Columbia University at 1 p.m. Bank of England Governor uh, Andrew Bailey. He is speaking at LSE at London School of Economics. 1 p.m., an auction of the notes that have traded, as John said, like penny stocks, $42 billion of two-year notes <coughs> at a time when you've seen a roller coaster unheard of in modern history in terms of suddenly pricing out any further rate hikes and even rate cuts through year end. And at 5 p.m., we hear from Fed Governor Philip Jefferson talking about the transmission and implementation of monetary policy at Washington and Lee University. <clears throat> Does monetary policy matter less when the banking stresses do it for you? That is the question facing so many people at this moment. Michael Wilson joins us now. He's chief U.S. equity strategist at, uh, and CIO at Morgan Stanley. Of course, many of you on Global Wall Street hang on every word if you agree or disagree. Mike, I see a massive polarity in the equity markets right now. It's a select group of haves and everybody else dragging along looking for the next narrative. Am I right on that polarity? Yeah, that's right, uh, Tom. I mean, you know, you guys were talking about the bond market's volatility here recently. We've been focused on that, too. We think that, you know, the bond market is sort of jumping ahead of what the Fed is saying. And that's the first time we've really seen that uh, in quite a while, meaning that the bond market is somewhat, you know, dismissing the Fed's dot plot, which I find interesting because I think the equity market may start to do that, too. And it's already happening under the surface, as you alluded to, meaning small cap stocks and anything that's sort of viewed as lower quality or ha will have right. challenges with needs capital availability is, is being punished. And then we're left with, you know, 20 stocks kind of carrying the day. I mean, the 20 stocks carrying the day screams the roll up I've been talking about for six, seven, eight months with the interest rate regime that you studied at Michigan a few years uh, back. With that said, is it a return to what you and I knew years ago? Or is this a new higher interest rate reg regime for the stock market? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. I think what it, what, it, what it really is, is it's just a much less predictable world. And this has been our theme for the last couple of years, is that we're entering a period of higher economic volatility, right? The last 20 years has been a world of repression where, you know, all of these metrics were somewhat predictable. And that's, you know, that's for companies, that's for the Fed itself, that's for investors. And now we're entering a world where it's just not as predictable. Um, and that means higher risk premiums, whether we're talking about credit, whether we're talking about term premium in the bond market, uh, or we're talking about equity risk premium. In our view, you know, I think people are operating as if we're going to go back to that predictable world. And that's, I think, misplaced. A lot of people have been reading your prognostications of lower earning multiples for week after week after week, the latest uh, from you. Given the events of the past few weeks, we think guidance is looking more and more unrealistic and equity markets are at greater risk of pricing in much lower estimates ahead of any hard data changes. Mike, given that you've been saying this for a while and given the fact that the, we have continued to see resilience in equities that refuse to go down, how do you push back and say, you guys are going to wake up? It might not be yet, even if we get disappointed earnings, but you will. Well, look, we try to navigate that inside the equity market, right? So, I mean, last year we, we saw a pretty big degradation in, in multiples, but as we pointed out again today, all that was due to higher interest rates. None of it was due to higher risk premium, which is the part of the multiple that is, you know, pricing in what growth is going to be. Now, I would push back on the pushback, which is that the market is starting to revalue or devalue what I would say the companies that are most uh, at risk of missing estimates, as I mentioned <clears throat> earlier, you know, lower quality uh, companies, uh, more cyclical companies, uh, smaller cap companies that are going to have a hard time with you know, what's going on in the regional banking system. Um, so it is happening. It's just, you know, it takes a little bit longer and everybody, you know, kind of focuses on the S&P 500 or maybe NASDAQ 100 as these kind of, you know, bastions of safety. And that's true until it's not. Well, OK, so let's talk about the repricing. Last year, we were talking about big tech. And this year, the repricing has been in the opposite direction. I'm looking right now at Meta. Facebook shares up more than 71 percent so far year to date. Apple shares up more than 20 percent. I mean, basically, pick your pick your poison and it's up dramatically. How do you push back against this, against the recovery and some of the names that supposedly were going to come under pressure in a higher rate world? Well, I think you said it right. I mean, these companies took their punishment last year because they were, you know, probably the tip of the spear in terms of, you know, valuations out of bounds. When when rates went up, they they took it first. 
And you could argue that a lot of those uh, groups or, you know, stocks and sectors that they're in are in a recession already, right? They're, that's the area we are seeing layoffs. That's the area we are seeing retrenchment on costs. And, and I, think the, I think the debate now, Lisa, is have those companies cut costs and gotten in front of it enough where they can now see earnings growth again? Um, I think there's some appetite for that view. Uh, that's not our view. Our view is that uh, there's going to be probably be more cost cutting in that space because the malinvestment was just so egregious and the over earning was even worse. So I think it's just going to be kind of a drip, drip, drip. Um, you know, my, my suspicion is you know, markets tend to figure this out ahead of the actual numbers coming down. And because the bond market just repriced itself overnight, we think that risk for the equity market is elevated now more than it's been for the last six or 12 months. Mike, you've been labeled a bear, and I know what it is to be labeled a bear, and then people think that everything oh, you say is go. bearish no matter what. I'm just saying, even when potentially you do get constructive, are there any areas that you think have sufficiently repriced where you're starting to see opportunity? Well, look, I mean, financials have started to reprice in a meaningful way. You know, not all of these companies are going to have problems, uh, you know, right. that we're seeing in some of these. So, yeah, I think it's happening. I mean, the other thing I would just point out is that, you know, financials tend to lead uh, the overall market. But that's one area for sure. Um, some of the retail, you know, some of the consumer areas have repriced. They've been repricing for years. You know, we just added a name to our fresh money buy list today as a retailer. So, you know, I think these the, there are definitely areas. I mean, markets go through these periods with, I call it a rolling bear market, right. rolling recession. We've, we've kind of, I think, uh, came out with that view a few years ago. And now people have used it. But, you know, that's the way it works. And, and, and you right. know, we're looking for opportunities now at the stock level. But at the index level, it just does not look attractive to us. Mike Wilson, the thing that's different this time around is the pile of money in what's called private equity private markets, it, well, can they be a catalyst for a trade? Not like Milken years ago, but can they be a catalyst for a roll-up of all these troubled companies? Well, look, I mean, first of all, I don't think there's that many, you know, troubled companies. I think we have a situation where valuations are out of bounds and we need to correct that. Um, I absolutely think there's tons of cash out there where there's private or public money, you know, pu public money that meaning asset owners that can come in at the right price, and it will. So whatever we're going to get here in the next three to six months in terms of finally resetting the valuation appropriately, getting estimates down, I don't think we're going to stay at very, very low price levels for a very long time. I, we're not in the camp that we're in a secular structural bear market. This is a cyclical bear market. It has some, some completion to it. And your, your question is really around, is there enough cash and uh, investable funds out there to right. kind of you know, stabilize things. And I think the answer is absolutely yes. Okay, Mike Wilson, thank you for the brief this morning. Hugely valuable. He is, of course, with Morgan Stanley. I, I thought you were vulnerable. I thought Dr. Wilson provided wonderful Monday therapy. Thank you. I try. You. I try to get it everywhere I can. <clears throat> no, I think it's important to note he's not looking for some sort of structural bear market. And the opportunities potentially in banks, I think, is fascinating that he was highlighting. This will be a discussion to continue, and we will uh, do that. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on radio and television. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The failed Silicon Valley Bank has a new owner. North Carolina-based First Citizens Bank shares will buy about 72 billion of SVB's assets at a discount of 16.5 billion. Now, as part of the deal, the FDIC will get stock appreciation rights in First Citizens worth up to $500 million. Authorities took extraordinary measures to shore up confidence in the financial system after Silicon Valley Bank collapsed. The head of Credit Suisse's largest shareholder has resigned after his comments helped spark a slump in the bank's shares. Amar al Qudari was chairman of Saudi National Bank. His remarks came in an interview March 15th with Bloomberg's Yusuf Kamel al Din. I'm wondering whether you would be open to assisting further if there was another call for additional liquidity from Credit Suisse. The answer is absolutely not for many reasons outside the simplest reason, which is regulatory and statutory. We now own 9.8% um, of the bank. If we go above 10%, all kinds of new rules kick in. Saudi National Bank says al Qadari is leaving due to personal reasons. Twitter is looking for whoever leaked parts of its proprietary source code. That code was posted on GitHub, the widely used code repository that's now owned by Microsoft. GitHub complied with Twitter's request to remove the data, but Twitter now wants it to identify anyone who posted, downloaded, or uploaded its code. 
global news powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. Look, I think we've done a pretty damn good job. People's uh, savings are secure, and uh, even those beyond the $250,000 uh, of the FDIC is guaranteeing them that American taxpayer is not going to have to pay a penny. The banks are in pretty good shape. What's going on in Europe isn't a direct consequence of what's happening in the United States. In pretty good shape as well. The president of the United States, of course, speaking on a banking crisis. I think, Lisa, we've had four life, once in a lifetime crises here since 2007. John Farrell, it's a crisis, is on assignment here for three days, wishing him safe travels. And it's Lisa Bramwitz and Tom Keene on Bank Recovery Monday. I guess that's what it is. I mean, the yeah. fact is, Chris Whalen tweeting out about first citizens putting somebody out of their misery. There's a set of good news is here for Secretary Ellen. And the absence of bad news. And I think <clears throat> that's important because what really spooked the market I was like a that. sense yes. of a series of steps construct. that, uh, you know, really were seemed to be linked together, yeah. even if they weren't. And that was what gave rise to this narrative of some larger concern. The narratives to get the two-year yield to 4 percent, we're not there, 3.95 percent. The narratives to get oil above 70, it is. $68, $69. West Texas Intermediate is now 70.18. And S&P futures up seven-tenths of a percent. Um, I thought the, the discussion with Tina Fordham was just it was stunning. It was chilling. It was like literally back to my ute. Well, there are a lot of people who are concerned about the yeah. weakening of judicial power in Israel and then the firing right. of the one judiciary who stood up to Netanyahu. And that is what happened. And that's what's caused the eruption of these protests with real concern over the stability of the democracy going forward. And that, I think, is really underpinning right. what is driving so much attention to this. We're going to get to the bank crisis chat in Washington. Anne-Marie Horton is, of course, encyclopedic on it, but always so well read in on the international relations of the moment. I was thunderstruck, Anne-Marie, in talking to Tina Fordham about the illusions here of France and particularly Israel, back to my ute, of Sadat, the assassination of Rabin. Help us with Jews in America and particularly conservative, more orthodox Jews in America, which Pew Research of New Jersey says, you know what, these people are very Republican. Help us with the mm -hmm. lobby dynamics you're going to observe on this tumultuous Monday in Washington. Well, I think it puts a lot of people in difficult positions, right? Because you, what you see in Israel is a huge backlash against what Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu wants to do. Even President Herzog has come out and said <laughs> we should take a pause. I mean, there's been protests, though, we should note, over the past weeks, really months, about this judicial overhaul. But as Lisa mentioned, it came to an absolute um, point of just overflowing outrage when... While in London, actually, he sat down for an interview with Pierce Morgan, Netanyahu, that will yeah. air this evening. That will be interesting, given this moment. Fired his defense chief. And, and now there's a lot of havoc in the country. I mean, you, you see the Tel Aviv airport um, is broken up. But obviously, Israeli politics, Tom, to your point, matters a lot hey. with, uh, with Jewish Americans and constituents here, which we have seen lean Republican, especially during... Uh, the Trump administration, but potentially with what's going on in Israel, this is not something that Jews in America want to wake up to and see on their television screens. The enormity of this, folks, for those on radio, the imagery that we saw, Lisa uh, uh, Abramowitz, 600,000 plus was one estimate uh, of the protest just yesterday. I mean, remember the protests in Brazil? Like three, four years. It was that magnitude of streets uh, full as well. I mean, I, I guess that's enough on Israel, and we didn't even get to France there, but there's still a lot of banking <laughs> issues going on in the hoardern world. Well, and that's where the focus is probably more yeah. than the geopolitics, and it has been. And we do know that there are going to be hearings coming up, I believe, on Wednesday, Anne Marie. What are we going to glean from them? And I know a lot of people would say nothing. They're just hearings. They're grandstanding. They're talking about, we are mad. Something bad happened. But I am wondering whether it gives any indication <laughs> of the willingness to create a different regulatory structure or deposit insurance or some of the other things that people were talking about last week. Well, you got the ethos and tone of what the hearing is going to be, Lisa, which is definitely that lawmakers are going to be very upset that something broke, right, in the financial system. And they want to 
point the finger who was responsible. So Wednesday, when you have these regulators like the FDIC chairman and also the vice chair for supervision at the Fed, Michael Barr, show up to the House Financial Services, there's going to be very pointed questions about what went wrong, who should have been supervising this? Was it the hands potentially um, of a lack of oversight at the Fed in Washington, or is this about the supervision at the San Francisco Fed? And then obviously you're going to try to also potentially uh, garner some more questions and concerns about the state of the economy. Are there, are there more underlying risks to other banks because you have the Fed hiking interest rates so aggressively? And then potentially a discussion about the FDIC cap, which is what the hands of lawmakers can actually change. Yeah. And I think this got to the tension of last week with Secretary Yellen talking about a blanket change. That would have to be, when you look at the insurance cap, that would have to be in the realm of Congress, not something the Treasury Secretary t can come out and do. But these hearings are probably a non-issue because there's very little willingness to do that, right? There's very little willingness to be labeled as some sort of bailout friend of some of the, the banks, whether they're big or small. And that's really going to loom over everything. So why is Washington, D.C. having hearing after hearing on things that they're not going to take <laughs> action on when they actually have to take action on a budget and other things in Congress before the recess? Well, this is another good point. There's also the debt ceiling that is still um, circulating. When you talk to them about the budget, we're still waiting on the Republicans to have their budget proposal. But we also know that behind the scenes, they're working on a deal sheet, basically what they can go to the White House with and say, these are our demands in terms of fiscal spending cuts in order to get our votes to raise the debt ceiling. But of course, there's going to be hearings because they do need to find out and look into. I mean, the senators and, law and congressmen and women that I speak to say they do want a full autopsy. And potentially, you've had heard some of them talk about lifting the FDIC cap. That could be something that happens, but it won't happen right away. This is not going to yeah. happen in days and weeks <clears throat> and months, as to you mentioned. Amory, totally unfair question to end things out, but I'm going to go with it. On this Monday, oh, with bank stocks doing better, I mean, there's a set of good news here after the trauma of last week. Is there anybody in Washington moving on from this crisis, as Lisa alluded to earlier? Moving on? No, I don't think anyone is moving on. There's going to be hearings this week on Friday <clears throat> Uh, morning, we found out about this unscheduled meeting of regulators. Behind the scenes, you do know that officials are still looking at what's going on at First Republic. Do they need to extend a lending program at the Fed to help out that bank? No one is moving okay. on just yet, even though the president has said over the weekend he thought they did a, quote, damn good job. Amory Horton, thank you so much. Our chief Washington correspondent, of course, with a modest program in the afternoon. What's it called? Balance, Balance of, of Power. Balance of Power. Thank you so much, Amory uh, Horton. With Joe Matthew, I should point out. Futures up 29, Dow futures up 219. NASDAQ up half a percent is all 21.47 on the VIX. What an odd Monday in that it's all clear Monday, but as Anne-Marie just said, no, it's not. Well, there's still a angst out there, and there's still a feeling of the next shoe oh. to drop. I mean, Mike Wilson talking about the potential for earnings pressure in a substantial way, and this, to <clears> me, <throat> is the unknown. This, to me, is the lack of immediate histrionics, but longer-term pain that people are trying to wrap their heads around. This idea of what happened happens if credit conditions right. tighten materially? What happens if the lag effects are more material than people had previously thought? And all of a sudden, you start to feel them in a much more significant way. And, and, and the other thing is the surprises out there looking at the unmovable story, which is the BTMM screen on the Bloomberg, which shows me higher yields, which really haven't budged yet. I mean, to see a given 5% statistic go to 4.90, Correct. I really don't believe I've observed that. I looked at some mumbo jumbo that only Ira Jersey understands, and it legged up Friday. Well, okay. I mean, that's a fact. So I'm looking right now at six-month T-bill yields. We talked about how they uh, they they went north of 5%, and this was a huge threshold moment, because suddenly <clears throat> you go into money market funds and get more than 5%. Those yields have come down, and perhaps to your point, because of the floods of cash into money markets as people tried to take advantage of these rates and gain that safety, now they're at 4.68%. That's still 4.7%. People used to get nothing on their cash. So you can think that that's still a lure. The problem hasn't gone away for the banks that are trying to attract and this is the deposits. information. Let's be clear. Over the weekend, Friday, maybe, we saw deposit flows. But they were deposit, deposit flow statistics from a long time ago, like 10 days ago. Exactly. <laughs> and I'm fascinated to see what the next tranche of flow data shows us. I'm going to suggest mom and pop are moving their money.
and I they're mean, moving the money into money markets, not necessarily even to larger <clears throat> banks or even, you know, within well, a certain I, bank. Not, That's basically you know, more I, of the issue. I mean, it's, it's for, just full disclosure, folks, I really can't comment on the niceties of the triple leveraged all-cash fund, but it's never been like it's been. You've been just rocking we, it. We may get our first 2 and 20 payout from the fund <laughs> because of flows in like five years. I hear ChatGPT is really excited for its uh, 2 and 20 payout. It is. Well, we're looking at that ETF again, but, you know, again, this is the 5% world that has changed uh, all. What has changed is, again, green on the screen, the equity shock of this March. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance, Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Keene. John Farrell on assignment here over the next uh, number of days. I do think it's a Three Island uh, a tour. We'll see when he uh, returns. Uh, lots going on this morning, and if you're just waking up into this on radio and television, it is an American recovery in the presence of this banking crisis. We just heard the president commenting here on the better uh, news. Futures up 30, Dow futures up a solid 230. Over 4,000 on the Standard & Poor's 500. I don't think that's a small issue. Mike Wilson talking about the resiliency of a few. The VIX 21 point Four five yield 3.94 migrating towards 4%. We're not there uh, yet. Two stands giving me disinversion and oil critically above $70. Uh, West Texas Intermediate, $70.11 a barrel. It is a summation of good news for banking. And you see it pre-market, moving with the movers, Lisa Abramowitz. Yeah, we're looking at some of the uh, mid-sized banks. It is important to note that, yes, we are seeing gains today with First Republic shares up almost 30 percent. Wow, that sounds like a lot. They are down almost 90 percent <coughs> since March 8th. So just to give you a sense, when we start talking $15.81 a share based on the where we have come from, it's a very different kind of scenario. They were as high as $147 a share as recently as February. You could take a look at PacWest. Those shares lower by more than 60% since that March 8th moment, but you are seeing a bit of a rebound up about 11%. Western Alliance, similar story. Deutsche Bank is a more interesting story to me on some levels because it is sort of speaking to this question around systemic risk. Deutsche Bank came under a lot of pressure. A lot of people came out and fought that, said, you know what? It's not right. They actually don't have the same kind of regulatory pressure. Stop throwing the baby out with the bathwater. That's what we heard from Mike Wilson, not about Deutsche Bank, but just in general about financials, that it's looking a little more interesting. So how much are people able to quantify how much you can earn in a 5% well, world as a bank if you're not worried about sending some funding pressures that seem to have stabilized? I was in the harbor packing away the grand banks, and I, I did a survey, uh, Lisa, of nine, nine newspapers. Deutsche Bank wasn't a story this weekend. And based on what I read Thursday and Friday, I mean, I'm sitting at a cabana with Stuart, and it's a whole bunch of bankers having rum punches. And everybody's wired in on the phone to Bloomberg and Frankfurt going, is this Credit Suisse? And the answer, I believe, is no. And then the story just evaporated. Exactly. And so, you know, the whys, et cetera, people could do an autopsy of strange market moves and what people misunderstood or what <clears throat> games people were playing. But you are still seeing elevated credit default swap insurance protection. So, again, I don't know if they're games being played. Have the concerns abated mm -hmm. or have they just subsided for the moment as people reassess and wait for what's next? Quickly, unfair question to you. Do we look for announcements this morning or even through the day from government officials on this banking crisis? Not right now. It's we not really know. required yeah. because right now you're not necessarily seeing that urgency. And we did talk about what we heard on Friday from the FSOC meeting, the financial stability yeah, I, I read, meeting. Yeah. And Janet Yellen was there yeah. and Jay Powell was there and Tim Geithner was there. And they oh, were trying to up. assess what happened. They're on it, right? They don't want to have egg on their face <clears throat> with another. We need to raise 50 basis points. And then, oh, yeah, uh, First Republic just went under. Yeah, there we are. Futures up 31 and climbing this morning, up eight tenths of a percent on S&P. At futures. We need a brief, and we get it right now for someone who's wonderfully holistic here. Uh, her iconic work on foreign exchange over the years. She's chief U.S. economist, FS Investments. Laura Rahm joins us uh, right now. Laura, I've been dying to ask you this question off your research note. You go right to the confidence of Americans. Is it a confidence of one America, two Americas, or dare I say, even three Americas? How do you study? our confidence in crisis. 
I think at the, you know, right now, none of the confidence measures are back to where they were pre-COVID for, and for as strong as the economy is, confidence has been very tempered throughout the last year. And right now, to your point, depending on where you look, it does look more fragile, but I think we are going to really see the direction things are moving in over the next month. It's actually the one piece of data this week that I think is really important and could be telling the consumer confidence data. And I think when we look for, you know, right. the talk talk of recession <clears throat> is in the air again. It's, you know, the volume's been turned back up to 11 on that. But if you look at the underlying macro data, it's still really strong and confidence exactly. could be the weak link there. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm gasping here over the plague uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, Laura, I, I, I want to talk about this disconnect between interview after interview stating the slowdown of America and the statistics I see, what is your GDP call for this ending first quarter? It's over 3%. And Terrible. I think Lisa, that it's, a crisis. It's, it's really strong. <laughs> Labor market, really strong. I just want to roll my eyes when I hear people talking about cracks in the economy because you've got to take out a microscope to really find any sign of significant slowing. And so, you know, can, can we maintain this? Probably not. But do we slow to something? You know, I have been expecting some kind of slowdown. I don't think that's a bold call. The Fed is aggressively raising rates. At some point, they do usually push the economy into a period of deep slowness, if not contraction. But my outlook has always been for the end of 2023. I think the question we ask now is, have the banking-related uncertainties, is that going to pull some kind of mild recession forward? But this is the problem for the Fed. They are not out of the woods. They are still stuck with this really difficult policy a fork in the road. Because if you look at the data in and of themselves, continued rate hikes are a no-brainer. And I feel like in their statement, they tried to minimize the banking uh, systemic, yeah. you know, issue, and they tried to just look at the data, and they, you know, they're trying to pivot, but it's it's hard. Lisa, the Consumer Board comp Consumer Confidence number from a 102.9 is going to crater to a 101. <laughs> I mean, that's that speaks of a 3% GDP number we're talking about. And we've seen better than expected services activity over in Europe and in the U.S. again and again and again. Laura, then how do you push back against a market that's seeing rate cuts of almost 100 basis points through next January? How much are they wrong in your view? How much is the next stop perhaps five and a quarter percent, five and a half percent before we see rate cuts? I push back really hard against the rate cut expectation. You. Um, you know, well, I think we will see that temper over the coming several months. Um, you know, we the 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 cutting of 100 basis points to me is more of an indication of a chance that we're going to hit some systemic banking need to go back to ZERP. You know, that's the probability. It's not just 100 basis points of rate cuts. But at the end of the day, if the Fed <clears throat> really sees a recession coming, they're going to do something. I just think the timing of all of that plays out much later. When you think about the Fed and all of these, you know, they've still got a big inflation problem. And I think for them, they are really trying to separate um, the banking from the economy. One thing I was disappointed about is they didn't adjust quantitative tightening. I think lost in all of this is the fact that reserves, cash reserves as a share of bank assets for the big banks is really high, but for the small banks, it's pretty low. We're down to 6%. Um, I think QT should be winding down at this point, but we'll see what they do as they kind of look back and reassess um, you know, these banking measures. Because you can't kind of give the banking system money on the one hand right. and then be taking it away on the other hand. I think that was a that was a miss. And probably a lot of people would glean a little bit of honesty from them if they see the balance sheet going up and at the same time they're saying, no, Q, uh, QT is still full, uh, full board ahead. So, you know, there's a question about messaging there. Laura, from your point of view then, do you think that as we've seen so far, if we don't see any more bank failures, that the credit tightening from banks will not be sufficient to really do the work Work for the Fed to the degree that markets think. How do you basically extrapolate that out in kind of an absence of information that people are worried about? 
I, I think we will get information. I think that a lot of the banks will be talking more about their lending standards. Uh, it's hard to imagine coming out of this with looser lending standards. They're going to tighten somewhat. But we have seen one of the reasons the Fed has had to raise rates so aggressively is because our economy is less interest rate sensitive than it has been during prior episodes. When everybody had interest-only mortgages, it didn't take as many rate hikes to slow us down. <clears throat> and we still had to raise rates to over 5%, and that was without an right. inflation problem. Uh, Laura, so, very, to me, I, I, we're running out of time, Laura. And yeah. just, you've been great here pushing back against the gloom. And I guess in crisis, it's normal to have gloom. Is the great contrarian call here to say that America will prosper? For the first two, three, for the next two, three quarters, absolutely. I think our the economy remains really resilient. And I think that the Fed's um, policy keep, challenges keep aren't going to go music. away. The volatility is going to stay with us. And I think yields right now are <clears throat> have corrected down so far. I think we're headed back up again. Right. I don't know if we can get back to where we were, but I think especially in the long end, we're headed back up. Laura, uh, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it with FS Investments. I wanted to cue the American patriotic <laughs> music there. I mean, you know, honestly, the great blown call of a lot of people over the last 12, 18 months, who knew a bank crisis was coming? I didn't know it. Is not the gloom, but the measured caution on our economic prosperity. I believe I heard Ms. Rahm say it's a 3% GDP. Nobody saw that. You're, you're being all Warren Buffett on us right now. You're basically, you know, America is strong. Look, there are a lot of people who point to this resilience, and this is the tension, right? And this is the tension that Laura Rehm was talking about. On one hand, you've got a Fed that doesn't want things to be this uh, this strong in terms of growth because that's what's going to cause inflation to keep going. So they're going to keep raising rates if we don't get a banking crisis. And then on the other hand, if you get a banking crisis, what things go too just... quickly, and then it's out of control. So it's sort of, you know, stuck between a rock and a hard place in every way. I'm going to ask this question. I don't care if you don't like it. I mean, the interns over there saying, don't ask it. What's wrong with just pausing and letting Secretary Yellen and others handle a legitimate deposit fear? What's wrong with pausing and waiting for the data to come in, as Ms. Rahm suggested there with consumer confidence? You're not alone. A lot of people are saying the same thing. Bob Michael of J.P. Morgan Asset Management adamant that the Fed needed to pause. A lot of other people agreeing with him, saying this is the time to assess those long and variable lags because there is an effect that's coming into the market. The concern is, is that inflation still is running pretty hot. So okay. is there going to be a mistake on that side if they don't necessarily <clears throat> adjust? I, I, the parlor game here, which you and John love, you know, folks, how much I hate it. The bottom line is... I, I look at pausing and you can say we're going to pause and we're ready to jump back on the inflation fear if we see it. A lot of people would agree with you. On the flip side, if they had raised, if they had paused and then also said there's no banking crisis, everything is sound, then why'd you pause? West Texas Intermediate, 70.21 in recovery. Torsten Slock at 8.30. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Silicon Valley Bank branches will open under a new name today. The FDIC says First Citizens Bank shares has agreed to buy the failed lender more than two weeks after its collapse. The North Carolina-based firm will purchase all of their deposits and about $72 billion of SVB's loans at a discount of $16.5 billion. Some $90 billion in securities will remain in receivership. Credit Suisse faces the threat of a possible investigation and disciplinary action over how top managers ran the bank in the lead up to its collapse. Switzerland's banking regulator told the Swiss newspaper that officials are considering options. She says Credit Suisse had a cultural problem that led to a lack of accountability. In Israel, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is considering a delay in his judicial overhaul plan after a night of demonstrations. Thousands protested after Netanyahu fired his defense minister for criticizing his plan to reduce the power of the Supreme Court. In Germany, it's a day of travel chaos. Air and rail services came to a halt due to a one-day strike. Workers are demanding bigger pay hikes because of inflation. And in France, unions are planning a 10th day of strikes tomorrow over President Emmanuel Macron's decision to raise the retirement age. Millions of people have joined the protests since January. 
And Apple CEO Tim Cook discussed supply chain issues with China's Commerce Minister today. And that underscored the importance of the relationship between the leading U.S. consumer tech company and its key partner. Apple is looking to diversify its production. Still, its most important products are predominantly assembled in China. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. This time is different. I don't think we have quite the systemic issues in the banking system that we did back then. Um, obviously, um, you know, the, the Fed now ha having raised rates so aggressively does have some uh, ammunition, some dry powder uh, to, uh, if, to obviously cut rates and, and improve the situation. But, you know, it's, it's what you don't know that you worry about. Chris Morangi with immense experience with the Mario Gabelli, Gabelli Funds, the co-CIO uh, there. And, and I'm just going to say this, folks, it's simple. Guys like Morangi live for the, the sweat of this, the, the, the fear of it that's out there as being uh, opportunistic. Uh, Jen Farrell, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom King, thank you for joining us on a Monday to stagger through the week. Mr. Farrell, uh, on a key assignment, I had something to do. Conti was thrown out of the tots and, you know. He's All a of a sudden, he, I think he's, you know, being interviewed for it, is frankly. I, mean. <laughs> I love how he's being interviewed for both, you know, some central banking position as well as coaching yeah. the tots and, you know, what's next? I, I, no, no, I, seriously, I think he's over talking to, um, uh, you know, Conti's out and it's going to be a changed uh, team. To that point of Chris Morangi, or Lisa, and I think this is important, value guys like Mario Gabelli live for fear. Except this fear doesn't fear like the previous fears, if I'm there are enough, somewhat clear on that. There are enough people who live for the fear that the fear hasn't happened in market pricing. That, I think, is sort of the conundrum yeah, that people yeah. in equity markets are facing. <clears throat> and so how do you figure out what the opportunity is if the opportunity isn't as good as it would be without all those other people hunting fear? What we're going to do now is look at the part of the market nobody's talking about because fear sells and uh, cheerleading doesn't, and that is the 12 stocks that are going up, led by Microsoft and, of course, AAPL. Uh, and, I, and joining us right now, Alex Webb joins us from Bloomberg Quick Take here. Alex, I don't want to talk to you about financial ratios. I want to talk about something slipped under the zeitgeist but is in your world over the weekend Bloomberg owns a high ground on Apple rumors. His name is Mark Gurman, and he put out a blistering note over the weekend saying, everybody's got this wrong. Apple is aware of our most requested features. Are we underestimating Apple's dominance and their ability to innovate? I, I think it's been particularly interesting if you compare Apple to Google in recent months, where you, people are suddenly starting to get very skittish about Google's mid to long term prospects. A combination of ChatGPT, uh, you know, a ChatGPT boosted uh, Microsoft, you know, coming after them in search. TikTok also a place where increasingly young people go to find their restaurant recommendations, and uh, that's a space that Google has owned for a long time. We've realized, therefore, quite how resilient Apple is. The way that they are deeply rooted in people's day-to-day -day use. People have iPhones. They're highly unlikely to trade those iPhones in. Uh, the big threat coming up on the horizon, though, of course, is what is the next generation of hardware that is perhaps going to succeed right. The smartphone, and that is where Apple is uh, throwing a huge amount of money when it comes to smart glasses. And they have the huge amount of money. I mean, if I'm looking at 27 times multiple back up from 21 or whatever, it's been on a run, like Mr. Nadella over at Microsoft. And what I find, and uh, Alex, away from your mission, um, I look at United Healthcare with a ginormous bond offering out there. Is this a time where Apple and others with persistent cash flow reload? Apple has five. 5.1% debt, every classroom in the world would say Mr. Cook is handling that wrong. Well, Apple has consistently said for the past seven, eight years they want to be essentially cash neutral. The challenge they have is that no matter how fast they sell debt, they also, you know, practically print money because they have in the order of $100 billion of free cash flow every year. So it's, it's a real challenge, actually, for Apple to get to that point. Uh, they are gradually getting there, but it's, it, they have sort of 
in that sense, a victim of their own success. They do do significant buybacks. They have started returning more money to shareholders. They do not have the appetite for big deals that, say, Microsoft does with its you know tens of billions that it's spending on Activision Blizzard. Apple sees not only huge execution risk, but also um, a lot of regulatory risk if you do that. They don't want to necessarily draw attention to parts where they might be a little bit dominant. So that money does come back to shareholders in various forms. It is still a challenge for them to, to do it at the pace at which they're making it. You say regulatory challenges, and I'm sure you're talking about just in terms of the dominance in the industry, but there are challenges as well in terms of their business over in China. I'm curious how much that's sort of preeminent uh, in the concern bucket for Tim Cook at a time when we're talking about TikTok hearings and we're talking about possible legislation. It is a significant issue for Apple in many ways. I mean, they, he met with the Chinese commerce minister over the weekend. There was a lot of talk there about the symbiotic relationship between Apple and China. In many ways, Chi um, Tim Cook is quite an important resource for China when it comes to ensuring that trade, gate, trade, you know, <clears throat> trade remains open with them because more or less all of their iPhones are made then. And what we've started to see in recent years, they're trying to bring a little bit more manufacturing into places like India. It's, far more easily said than done, not least because it's not just a question of having a factory there. You have to have the entire supply chain. There might be millions of jobs that are supported just making iPhones in China, but then you have all of the components that go into them um, the, you know, from you know, circuit boards and beyond that are made also in China. Now, you might have the really high value semiconductors coming out of Taiwan, but a lot of the rest of the supply chain is local to the manufacturing it has there. It's very hard to unpick yourself from that. It is the work of, of years, if not decades. How much, Alex, are big tech giants basically pitted against each other in this regime? I'm looking right now at Meta shares. I can't get over the rally that we've seen there. They're up more than 70% so far this year. And I wonder how they're going to potentially benefit if TikTok gets banned, because then they could just perhaps assume some of the uh, traffic, Snap also up on that uh, news. And then you have the likes of other companies, more considered staid big tech that rely on China for doing business. How much are they sort of pitting their their lobbyists against each other in Washington, D.C. right now? Well, it is interesting because, of course, when you think about the software platform type companies like Facebook, like Google, you know, and there's much talk of the bifurcation of global tech that you have. You have a Chinese ecosystem and then a sort of Western ecosystem. You know, Google and Facebook do not have access to China. There's some cloud business that Google has there, but fundamentally the main search business that drives the lion's share of revenue isn't in that market. They don't particularly, therefore, count on it for growth. Apple, very, very different. Apple is in and of itself kind of a, a platform. It needs that market not just to manufacture, but also to sell products. So it, it is in a very different situation. One note of hesitation I'd say about Facebook is that um, when you think about the relationship with TikTok and the competitive threat there, in a sense, TikTok can be, in one sense, useful to Facebook because mm -hmm. it can say, we don't, have a we don't have a monopoly, we have fierce competition in social media, do not break us up, do not come for us, would you rather, and they literally do say this, would you rather have us or the Chinese? That's literally something that Nick Clegg, right. the, the president of Facebook, will say. So <clears throat> there's a little bit of nuance in there. Alex Webb, thank you so much. And again, folks, the path-breaking work of Mark Gurman. Look for it over the weekend on Apple. Mr. Webb, of course, coming from Queen Victoria Street and London. I, I really want to frame this, Lisa, and I'll let you do the news here. Isabel Schnabel, not only out of the German uh, economic combine, but also out of Berkeley, was the star of Jackson Hole. She came in there, not as a stranger, we all know who she is, but she stopped traffic. The deer, the elk were out in the swamp, stopping, listening to Isabel Schnabel talk about the moment at Jackson Hole. Here she is again moving markets. Yeah, basically, uh, Bloomberg reporting, uh, people who spoke with the uh, the sources said that Schnabel pushed for the ECB statement to say that more hiking was possible. She basically was more hawkish on our <clears throat> concerns of inflation, basically arguing against basically saying that we're done um, and really trying to uh, remove any explicit wording, but also to indicate that it was important to be uh, more aggressively tackling inflation. This isn't important because we have continued to hear that same kind of tone coming from ECB members, right. even as <clears throat> U.S. officials have been a bit more reserved with how much more is required. And you wonder about dollar breakdown. We're back down to support on DXY. DXY is a major pair. It includes a euro, 54, 56% as well. Yen, sterling, and the rest. But the two-day 
the DXY chart really gets you down to a 102 level. We haven't broken down yet, really, have we? But this is really going to be interesting. Why didn't the euro rally? When you hear all of these hawkish prognostications, Isabel Schnabel basically saying we should guide to a higher rate. No. Yet, you know, basically market saying, no, you're not. The news continuing here and the headline news for those of you on radio and television across America, American banks doing better this morning. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Central banks playbook when there is financial stress, no liquidity at it. They don't believe we have a banking crisis. This credit crisis is going to be disinflationary. Those cuts that are priced by the market could be justified, but the conditions that would warrant those cuts would be pretty aggressively bad conditions. When the Fed tightens, real things break, and unfortunately, real things are breaking now. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Nothing broke over the weekend, so we're back to risk on. We're also back with Tom Keen. He is back from vacation. Jonathan Farrow off. I'm Lisa Abramowitz as we look at a market, and I think you put it well. Why are we seeing risk on? Well, it seems like there is calm. It seems like crisis, maybe not over, but paused. There was elements of it last week within the true crisis that we observed some real heartbreaking moves. I mean, I look at Deutsche Bank just on Friday was jaw dropping, but everything, including Deutsche Bank in Europe, stabilized. And of course, in America, the banks have more than stabilized. First Republic advances this morning. Yeah, and people are talking about this idea that nothing did collapse over the weekend. We didn't see another crisis. We haven't seen any kind of continuation <coughs> in terms of uh, small and medium-sized bank angst. And that is a sign yeah. that perhaps you could see resilience, natural credit tightening, and easier potential monetary policy. There's nuances here in, in things, Lisa, about looking at the data. It's a busy data week as well. Michael McKee will be the star this week looking to the, the PCE numbers out later. But to me, the immovable forces are one, Laura Rahm talking up 3% present GDP. Buoyant is how I'd put that. And the other one I'd look at is Jim Bianco saying, I'm sorry, it's a 5% world. And those are two different worlds, but they overlap and dovetail in some form of confidence. Right, and this is sort of the nodes of uncertainty right now. Do you have really hawkish central bankers or mm -hmm. do you have some sort of crisis that uh, causes some sort of pause? I want to bring Seth Carpenter of Morgan Stanley, the, the global chief economist, over the yeah. weekend coming out and saying, if disruption in the banking sector delays an extension of policy tightening, then a soft landing is still possible. <clears throat> but the downside risks have gotten bigger. The no landing notion never made any sense. Uh, central I, banks were I, always going to force a landing one way or another. I am so fed up is this you know it, it's like come on this started with v-shaped i remember sitting in the studio with i don't know gura mckee i can't remember maybe the late great ken pruitt and we're looking at v-shaped and nothing stopped from there and it's just what's the next phrase going to be what what what's the thing out there that the media is going to say is this is the narrative right now i don't think there's a narrative right now other than survival based on flows of banking deposits and that, I think, is what's been playing out in terms of where the fear is right now. That fear seems to have abated. We are seeing a lift to the market. And I do think it's interesting how we were talking with uh, with uh, Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley about seeing opportunity in some of the financial stocks after what we just saw, still led by tech. The Nasdaq still doing better than good, to use your phrase, at a time when people see that as a stalwart of strength. No, let's look at the data here quickly. Uh, up seven-tenths of a percent on the Standard & Poor's 500. That's a 4,000 level, Lisa. To me, that is the key thing in the back and forth and the gloom. This is a resilient market led by a few select things, as Alec Webb just talked about. And today is a divergence from the trend of tech outperformance, where you see the S&P outperforming, up seven tenths yes. of a percent versus the four tenths of a Listen percent gain on the Nasdaq. The this being driven, bonds, and now this is driven at though, <laughs> by, uh, by this question around financials leading. You're seeing yields yeah. just a bit higher. Again, this is what happens. You see strength, you see stability. People start to price in more rate cuts. Rate hikes, I should say, although just marginally, with just a slight tilt up. Somebody said to me, how'd you get this cough? And I said, well, it's really difficult if you're with Stuart having a rum punch under the mango tree. And then you go out in the sun. And then the trick is if you go back under the mango tree, that's when 
you know, you get that that tourist cough. I'm kind crying of thing. for you, really. You're making me it's feel difficult. just, you know, I'm. I'm... <laughs> Have you ever done the big cruise ship thing? Somebody no. stopped me down there. You know, love the show. Blah. Where's Bramo? Is she as gloomy as she really is? <laughs> and 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 he said to me, you should really do a surveillance cruise. He was serious. You serious about that? One of those cruise ships, like they go into Venice and they got 45 stories on them. Could you see Pharaoh on a cruise? No, I think that he has made his <clears throat> position very clear. I'm not going to represent him, but I think that. Yeah, uh, but if the paycheck you know. is enough. Uh, Farrell will be, he'll be, get out of my way, we're, we're so, going on. I mean, so come on. It's going to be like Survivor, so, you know, surveillance style. It's basically, I like that. You know, Very good. Survivor cruise with surveillance. Survivor cruise All right, let's save this right now and get a sense of what's changed and how much we can kind of read into the optimism that we're feeling in the morning, uh, at least uh, for Appleton's, some sort Appleton's of uh, period Thank of time. You. Lisa Hornby, head of U.S. multi-sector fixed income at Schroeder's, joining us now. Lisa, I want to get your sense of what's changed. Have we gotten enough stability? in the lack of news over the weekend to go risk on today? I think possibly temporarily. I think there's a bit of a sigh of relief that you know Deutsche Bank, amongst others, are still standing uh, this Monday morning. Um, I don't think we're quite out of the woods yet. You know, I guess part of it is there's a bit of a sentiment uh, swing. Everybody has gotten super bearish and, you know, rates rallied really, really aggressively and Everything seems to be a little bit calmer right now, so there's probably a bit of a technical now pointing towards the positive direction. That being said, I mean, our position has always been that when the Fed tightens aggressively, it exposes the excess leverage, the excess risk in the system, and that is going to cause things to break, and we've, we've certainly had an element of that. It feels like people weeks. people are having a, sort of this polar experience. It's either a bipolar experience where it's either the banks are collapsing, we're all going straight back to zero, and everyone's going to just basically hide under their mattresses, or else the banks are going to be fine, and then the Fed eases, and then everything's also going to be amazing. It seems like both narratives are kind of coming to a fore right now at a time when, by necessity, the Fed is going to tighten credit conditions in a way that will have to hurt. So at what point have we priced that into the credit spreads? It's still are below traditional recessionary levels. I think the point you make is just highlights how much uncertainty there is in the market and how much potential volatility there is to come. I mean, we can look at what's discounted for the end of the year in terms of Fed rate hikes and say the market's pricing in a give or take 100 basis points, excuse me, of rate cuts by the end of the year. Or we could say, well, that's actually 50% of the market that thinks there's 200 basis points of rate cuts and the rest who think things are unchanged. You know, there's a huge a, a huge gap, a huge spread in, in the views out there. And I think ultimately what that means is you need to be compensated more to take risk. You need right. more risk premium embedded in markets, not less. Lisa, in CFA level one, there's a point where you passed and I didn't accounting asset liability of how bonds are accounted for. And the heart of the matter to me and the magnitude of the rate move we've had is held to maturity accounting. Do you at Schroeder's have any transparency or vision of the true state of held to maturity debt in this crisis, or is it unknown on a Monday? Well, you're asking me to draw back on a few years here at CFA Level 1, but, you know, our, the big banks certainly are are regulated to a different degree than some of the smaller regionals that have become known in the headlines more recently. And, and certainly the size of those books were larger in our view than those of the major, the, the, GCIB, the US GSIBs and even some of the larger US regionals. So there's, there's a threshold um, for, for when those books need to actually be marked to market and when they don't, and what needs to be reported in terms of unrealized losses. So, you know, I guess the, the bottom line for us is you have to know what you own. And you have to know what is on those mm -hmm. on the books of those types of issuers, and this is where credit analysts really um, come into the come into the fore because this is the type of environment where things <laughs> like that are exposed, and we've certainly seen that over the last three weeks. I looked, Lisa, at the opportunity for issuance here. We saw a ginormous healthcare issuance last week. Do you and Schroeder think we'll see a lot of issuance out there? I mean, there's certainly the last couple of weeks, there's been almost there's been a very, very light. Um, so we do think that there's a lot of pent up issuance waiting to come. <laughs> Markets stay like this. I think we'll see a, a good deal of issuance. It's interesting. Some of that, the healthcare issues that you mentioned actually have performed quite well, despite all of the volatility. So it does show that there's still a bid for for defensive um, healthcare pharma type names. I think that that does tell you something about how the market's going to respond to future issuance as well.
which low, which dislocation over the past couple of weeks were you taking advantage of, Lisa? And I know that you think that perhaps you need to have greater risk premia, but are there any areas where there's enough baked in that you think this is an attractive moment? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we were fairly defensive coming into this. And so there has been opportunity in our view in agency mortgages. There's some opportunity. And I think in the banking sector, you know, some of the higher rated senior U.S. GSIBs, I think that we've seen some opportunity there over the last couple of weeks, uh, particularly in the more fraught moments. Uh, some of the higher quality industrials, the more defensive names, as I, as I alluded to with healthcare, there's, you know, the whole market has cheapened. The whole market isn't worth, <clears throat> worth less. There's certainly uh, diamonds in the rough, if you will, and so mm -hmm. it's about spotting those. For in our view, right now, you still want to err on the more defensive side. Generally speaking, uh, we still think there's more volatility to come in, in probably in credit spreads. You know, we might be in for a little bit of a tactical bounce, as we said here. More market feels a little bit firmer today, um, and certainly people have gotten offsides <clears throat> and whipsawed with these moves, but. There's absolutely opportunity emerging. Lisa Hornby, thank you so much. With Schroeder's, and you see it, folks, in a two-year yield, an 18 basis point move, higher yield, lower note price, 3.94%, not up to 4% yet, uh, but there it is. Lisa, I think this is a huge conundrum, and I'm, I'm fascinated by the challenge that chief financial officers have right now and how do you brief, or even more importantly for CFOs, how and who do you listen to about what to do with a portfolio or what to do as a next move in issuance. I, I, I don't have any wisdom on that at all. Well, I think that this is really the conundrum for them because they're looking out into a black box of whether rates are going up or down, and they're not sure what the borrowing environment is going to be like. So do you lock in borrowing costs where they are? Yes, much higher than they were perhaps a year ago, but perhaps lower than they will be in another six months. And that's what you speak about, trying to capture a window and lock in what you know at a time of so many unknowns. And, and again, you know, United Healthcare is, of course, what I was alluding to. And it's sort of like once they get going, they're like lemmings. And I wonder with one or two more ginormous six phone call blue chip deals that everybody just expands out their debt portfolio is one of the great surprises of April. It's the who, though, and this is important. Yes. It's the yes. top-rated yes. companies. The, the market's been pretty much locked for the lower-rated companies, and that, I think, has gotten some people concerned. It has yeah. to reopen for there to be the liquidity and the ability to fundraise and have IPOs yeah. that people are looking for to keep things going along. Something to talk about here in the next 45 minutes, also European debt dynamics as well. Torsten Slock of Apollo Group. This is the 8.30 hour. Stay with us on radio and television on this Monday. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The failed Silicon Valley Bank has a new owner. North Carolina-based First Citizens Bank shares will buy about $72 billion of SBB's assets at a discount of $16.5 billion. As part of the deal, the FDIC will get stock appreciation rights in First Citizens worth up to $500 million. Authorities took extraordinary measures to shore up confidence in the financial system after Silicon Valley Bank collapsed. The head of Credit Suisse's largest shareholder has resigned after his comments helped spark a slump in the bank's shares. Amar al Qudari was chairman of Saudi National Bank. His remarks came in an interview March 15th with Bloomberg's Youssef Gamel al -Din. I'm wondering whether you would be open to assisting further if there was another call for additional liquidity from Credit Suisse. The answer is absolutely not, for many reasons, outside the simplest reason, which is regulatory and statutory. We now own 9.8% um, of the bank. If we go above 10%, all kinds of new rules kick in. Saudi National Bank says al Qudari is leaving due to personal reasons. North Korea has test-fired two more ballistic missiles, adding to a recent barrage of launches. Kim Jong-un's regime had no immediate comment. The launches came as U.S. and South Korea conducted their largest amphibious exercise in about five years. And Bank of America has agreed to a 10-year deal to sponsor the Boston Marathon, one of the world's oldest annual running. Starting next year, the race will be referred to as the Boston Marathon, presented by Bank of America. Terms of the deal weren't disclosed. VOA will take over from Boston-based John Hancock, which has sponsored the race for almost four decades. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
what's unclear for us is how much of these banking stresses are leading to a widespread credit crunch. And then that credit crunch, you're right, just as you said, would then slow down the economy. This is something we are monitoring very, very closely. Neil Kashkari of Minneapolis with Margaret Brennan and Face the Nation. You can hear Face the Nation. It's one of our truly. You want to know when I've been wrong, Lisa? You, would you like to know? Like <gasps> I'm dying. They to said know. to Please me. They said to me, me. Let's put the Sunday talk shows on Sunday afternoon on Bloomberg Radio. And I, you know, the yelling and screaming. If you could hear me yelling three floors away, you're out of your mind. It's, it, it's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. Day one, it was successful. It was stunning. Stunning how people would listen to Neil Kashkari with Margaret on CBS Face the Nation, 2 p.m. Sunday afternoon. It's important to hear what big uh, <clears throat> market-moving market people have to say. I listen to these things. I think it's really important that Sunday talk shows give you a sense of what's in the mood, a great tradition. you know, going forward. <clears throat> it is true. Of course, we did that with our NCAA bracket as well, the Damien Show. Um, <laughs> let's digress here for a moment from his true expertise in emerging markets uh, right now. I know there's never been a year like this. Does the gambling industry, is this a profit opportunity for them that March Madness is so mad? Or is it a losing opportunity for the industry? Wow, it's a good question. I thought we were going to talk about emerging <clears throat> markets and global markets. We're getting there, we'll but get this there. is okay. more important. No, I, abs I mean, absolutely, the numbers are through the roof. I mean, it's been fantastic for the sport. I mean, all the number ones are out. I mean, Houston, Alabama, you know, Purdue, they're all out. So now you've got FAU. It could be, are you ready for this? University of Miami versus FAU. could be South Beach versus Boca Raton in the championship game. I mean, they'd have to move the championship from Houston to South Florida just to basically uh, accommodate the mass demand for... The, the, uh, but the ginormousness of it that you follow yes. every day, you and Michael Barr with Bloomberg Business of Sports, the ginormousness of this, does it get even better when everybody's bracket is as bad as mine? Well, I mean, it's within <clears throat> within the bad, there is good, right? I mean, look at what's going on here with Jim Laranega from, from University of Miami, George Mason channeling 2006. I mean, that was the quintessential upset year. Here we are today seeing much the same thing, right? With the exception of the UConn. I mean, right. the Huskies look pretty dominant out there. I wish you'd get as excited about Argentina <laughs> so as you do about George Mason. Well, there's he no balance. The payment crisis in, in EM, everything is hunky-dory. I mean, the one thing that stands out in this move, Tom, and we've yeah. talked about it, Lisa and I, you know, you were on break, is the dollar. I mean, the dollar's up, uh, sorry, down in 11 of the last 13 sessions. You don't normally see that in a crisis situation such as like we've witnessed over the last three weeks. So for me, it's all about this dollar weakness in the face of it all. And what is that really telling me? It's telling me two things. It's telling me, number one, what you're seeing is three-month, 10-year real yield curve in the U.S., flattening, real yield curve flattening significantly, mm -hmm. which is a short-term indicator of what the, you know, cyclical situation for the dollar is. But secular long-term, maybe this is real dollar debasement. Maybe this is real lack of confidence oh. because of moral hazard. And oh, I know, I know. I don't Bramo. believe it. I know. You but know it what? might be a little bit of that also. See, sprinkle it all together. <clears throat> Dollar's been down pretty significantly. EM's been rallying pretty hard in the face of all this. So people have been talking about the death of the dollar for a long time or the diversification Myself to, included. you know, gold and possibly, you know, the Chinese yuan as a possible reserve uh, currency. Should so I all just sorts leave the room so you well, two can second. gloom out here? No, but but a lot of Not people cool. are actually pushing back, right? Yeah. And you saw last week that even when the ECB came out and raised rates and indicated two weeks ago, but have come out with more hawkish discussions and rhetoric, you saw the dollar actually gain a little bit versus the euro. So it, we're not trading on rate differentials to the same degree. So what's the driver? What are people looking for? If it's not the haven play, it's not rate differentials, is it just a wash of noise and macro bets, just basically algorithms duking it out? It is rate differentials, Lisa. Carry is the reason that you're seeing Brazil, Hungary, Chile, Mexico all up this year relative to Taiwan, Singapore, Israel, all the low yielders. So it is absolutely an EM a carry story, maybe not in G10 effects. In G10 effects, you've got the pound, the euro leading. So, yeah, I mean, you've got Noki and, and Aussie down. So, you know, those high kind of yielders aren't really doing it in G10. But in EM, it is a nominal carry story for sure. Okay, so if it's a rate differential story, at what point do higher rates in the face of higher inflation cause weaker economic right. level growth. versus trend. We're right, having exactly. a conversation of where does level matter because right now it's all been about the trend and I would have to say I have no idea. You know, you're asking <laughs> me to you. point out a vector on a piece of litmus paper and, and, and ignore all the zeitgeist. I, I can't do that. No, but I think really truthfully I think you have right. to take note why this time is a little bit different. <clears throat> Dollar weakness in the I, midst of this crisis. I was having a rum tang down in the Caribbean. <laughs> and, Damien, I thought of you. Mr. Putin is talking about China and the yuan will be a dominant global currency. Mm -hmm. You and I have been reading about this what if 
for 30, 40 years. Do you actually buy the idea renminbi will be in some form a global currency? I mean, I definitely do. I think at some point, you know, further on down the road, it will have, and it still does have reserve, it does have value as a reserve currency. I do from a diversification benefit, but certainly not as a mechanism of payment. It's not nearly where the US dollar or even the euro is at this point. And I don't think that's going to change in the foreseeable future, quite honestly. But you can't ignore China. And so what am I looking at? You asked the question. You didn't ask the question. I'm going to tell you what I'm looking at. I'm looking at export orders it's in Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea. I'll ask myself because the question. Because all that matters here is the tug of war between China's economic reopening and the U.S. growth slowdown. And that's going to show up squarely right. in machinery orders, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. And what you're noticing is you saw a little bit of a rebound. But yeah. Nothing to speak of. So that's where yeah. you have to be focused. There's a guy with an Australian accent in my ear going, don't you dare ask him any more questions about March I Madness. Right. So instead, I'll ask you about Australian dollar. Oh, I mean, okay. you mentioned carry in that, yeah. but also commodities rolling over. Yeah. There was a huge run on Aussie. Is that easy trade over of Pacific Rim commodities? So what I've noticed, and it's a theme that J.P. Morgan's kind of hit on, is the fact that some of these currencies prior to the banking crisis were trading on housing markets. Because really your housing market domestically in places like Australia, New Zealand, Sweden, some of these, the central banks can't hike rates as aggressively as you would otherwise thought without completely seizing their local housing markets, which are inflated to begin with. So a lot of people have been selling the currency of those countries that may have housing issues because they doubt that central banks can really hike to fight inflation the way maybe the U.S. or other economies can. So I think that's why you saw Aussie down, why you might see Kiwi down, why you might see Sweden down, Kiwi's even Canada, Brazilian. because their housing markets are in the, uh, you know, they're, they're not doing so great. Okay, I want to just wrap this all together because there's a Please lot here. The soup of emerging us. markets and March Madness and is the March Madness and markets as well of a different Ooh, type. And nice. the idea that we've been talking about is that the weaker dollar story has been the preeminent sort of question mark emerging from a soup of uncertainty and in certain sectors pain. I'm curious whether you think, based on some of the technicals that we've seen, mm. whether it's sticky, whether you could yeah. see this actually persisting in a more meaningful way, or whether you think that this is really a head fake as people, again, grasp at straws to figure out what they can sell, when they can liquidate, and some of these other sort of more technical factors. Well, you, we've hit it on the head, right? The reason, in my opinion, that the dollar is weakening is that there was such late positioning in foreign markets to begin with. That's what's different this time. In 2008, you saw heavy offshore positioning <clears throat> in emerging market currencies you just don't have that this time around. So when you saw the you know the carry trade unwind of 08, when you saw the carry yeah. trade unwind of 15, you're just not seeing that to the extent this time around. And it's a little bit supportive. March Madness in the markets. I love that, Lisa. That's, that's really <laughs> I'm what sure. it's I'm sure I'm stealing it from someone. Other people have been oh, mentioning no. that. But, no, we're going to give credit <laughs> to Bramo on that. No. March Madness markets. Final <laughs> Four, Miami. I get it. Yes. Final Four. What do you think, Damien? I like FAU Miami. I like a, an all-South <laughs> Beach sort of setup. And, uh, and if it happens, I won't be there. I'll be here working. Um, just, you. just want to be really clear. Where, where is your progeny going to school? University of Miami. Uh -huh. yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just making sure. Yeah. By the way, just so you know, I've lectured at both UConn and University of Miami. Both are playing, and both have great student bodies. Smart, electric kids, dynamic. Really so excited to see your, that matchup. What's up. your fee to talk and then to give the your I don't, your I don't charge fee. It's just the fee <laughs> of just send you, education they send and learning. Yeah. Gallons oh, yeah. of tang, or is it just pure orange juice? <laughs> with the rum. Yeah. With the, the rum in it. Well, the Appleton's tang is good. Damien Sassar, thank you so much with Bloomberg Intelligence, truly intelligent here on the EM Dynamic. I'm going to quote what I was watching over the last week here is Argentinian peso. This is the quoted number, which is a 206. I haven't even looked black market. I don't know if it's broken through 400 yet, but the depreciation of the Argent, the devaluation, I should say, of Argentinian peso is there. And, and also, uh, Lisa, it is idiosyncratic and removed. But Turkish lira 19.09, and you just wonder how that fits in to their incredible foreign policy challenges. I mean, that's a big number. Yeah, at a time when they need to raise money to try to recover in some of the earthquake aftermath. And, you know, you really feel for right. that entire recovery process. How do they get the funds for that at a time when they really are seeing that depreciation? There was no question over the weekend that the article within the zeitgeist of the most interest was from Adam Posen of the Peterson Institute. Dr. Posen here will join us on America's new domestic foreign policy we may lose jobs. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. The Bloomberg 
Mr. Surveillance, good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom King, thank you for being with us. Mr. Farrell, uh, off on a well-deserved three-day uh, holiday. Lisa and I driving forward the conversation here, a constructive tone. Futures up 25, make it 26, six-tenths of a percent. Dow futures rock solid 200, 32,640 on the Dow. The VIX comes in constructively. 21.47. Look at Lisa. Just as I turned away to have some Appleton Tang, the two-year uh, here 3.96. We've come halfway to four percent just in the last 20 minutes. <laughs> this this thing. I mean, John was <clears throat> saying it trades like points. a penny stock. I mean, honestly, the volatility that we've seen in the two years has just been off the charts. Uh, really historic at a time when nobody knows how the Fed's going to respond to data that no one can predict. So this is basically a <clears throat> vacuum of uncertainty that people are trying to trade around it, and you can see that reflected in the act. Uh, the oil here, it's American oil up $1.33 now, again, lifting up near 2%, $70.58. I mean, the fact is it's a constructive Monday off of the Deutsche Bank caution that we saw on Friday. And it's driven by the financial stocks. And you've heard that from not only the stock picture, but also from the bond picture just there with Lisa Hornby saying that they were picking up those financial bonds. So on both sides, people are saying <clears throat> this perhaps was a bit overplayed and they're diving in for those opportunities. This next 30 minutes is extraordinary and what we love to do best. Thanks to our team for a lot of weekend work on this. Adam Posen will join us here at the 45 mark. But right now joining us, Tor Kirsten Slock, Chief Economist, Apollo Global Management. I really want to emphasize that uh, Torsten, with his work at Deutsche Bank over the years and, of course, at OECD in Paris, gives a global view to the U.S. trauma right now. You are known for one paragraph, one chart. What's the one paragraph, the one chart that matters for Tuesday morning? Well, what matters the most really at the moment is, as Lisa was just saying, the uncertainty about what is the behavioral reaction going to be in the regional banks and the banking sector more broadly as a result of what we're seeing at the moment. <clears throat> because everything we're seeing on our Bloomberg screens tells you that, oh, maybe this is just a modest tightening in financial conditions. Maybe the fra OIS bank funding cost spread is out about 40, 50 basis points. But what we don't know is the second order effect, namely what is the behavioral change going to be in terms of lending standards? Is it going to be harder to get a loan to buy a a car, to buy a house, to buy commercial real estate, to buy uh, anything for consumers and for corporates. And as a result of that, <clears throat> it is really still a bit unknown exactly how deep this is going to be. Okay, well, okay. I, I get the idea there's unknowns here, but to me, what we may end up with is not only, maybe not a, a worry about concentration of banking, but you know what? We're going to clear the market, remove the people that couldn't make it from zero to five percent, and will be stronger after the fact. Is that the Apollo view? No, so the, of course, outlook here is mainly uh, driven by the uncertainty about what is the response going to be in terms of how much tighter lending conditions will be. So if you look at the quantitative response in terms of pricing, I can see that on my Bloomberg screen, and that clearly shows that financial conditions are tighter and borrowing costs and funding costs for banks are higher. But if you then start to do small regressions and think about, well, what does the... Uh, tightening in lending standards that we saw in 2020, which is where the FRA OES spread is, if that corresponds to what we're seeing today, then you might have more coming <clears throat> in terms of effectively a higher Fed funds rate relative to what we have seen in the data on so my screen. So he's the only guy I know that actually understands the BTMM screen. I mean, that's what he's <laughs> talking there with F-R-A-O-I-S, the, the SOFR, S-O-F-R, which well, Iris says is the new LIBOR. It's all Greek to me, but there it is. This is the issue, though, for central bankers. They don't know how much additional tightening is being sort of implied into the market through a tightening and lending standards. And so if they're in the dark as well, if they don't have a clear sense of this, and the actual data that we're getting keeps on being strong, what's to stop them from continuing to hike in spite of all of the naysayers in the market that's screaming for rate cuts. You're absolutely right. I mean, the whole situation here is a function of data dependency. The data dependency, if you say, I only look at the incoming data, then you are by definition backward looking. So if, of course, there's a lot of uncertainty about what's coming in the future, and you just don't know how to quantify that, and no one knows that at this point, we all have to guess what are the implications of this, then the risks are more tilted to the downside. But what the Fed and the ECB and all central banks around the world are now waiting for is 
is, is this going to slow down the data? Are jobless claims going to go up every Thursday for the coming weeks? Will we also see non-farm payrolls begin to slow down? We've already seen durable goods and CapEx begin to slow down, but the bottom line is that we already had a slowdown coming because of the lag effects of Fed hikes, and now we're adding on to that a banking crisis, and that, of course, increases the risks that the slowdown is going to be faster. Is it fair to call what we have experienced a banking crisis? And this is really a question that people are trying to really wrestle with question. at a time really when we seem question. to see stability, and there are certain specific banks that had specific risks that blew up, and now we see ongoing sense of resilience. Is it fair to call it a banking crisis that's going to materially tighten lending conditions? Well, it's fair in the sense that we have seen bank runs, and a bank run is normally the number one characteristic of a banking crisis, but what is very unusual is that this banking crisis is not like normal banking crisis. A normal banking crisis is because of credit losses on the illiquid part of banks' books. Now we're actually seeing losses not on the credit side, but on the most liquid side of banks' books, namely in treasuries. So in that sense, we have basically never before had a banking crisis in a strong economy, and that's really unusual. So what's the distinction between a, a liquidity crisis, where it's just deposits being withdrawn, and a credit crisis? When does a liquidity crisis become a credit crisis? So that's exactly why what matters now is how are the banks going to respond to this liquidity crisis? Are they going to say, it doesn't matter, we're just going to lend more? Or are the three headwinds they're facing from higher funding costs, also more regulatory scrutiny, and also ultimately mm -hmm. a look at assets in a different way? Is that going to make them hold back? And if they do begin to hold back, the risk, of course, is that this could magnify the slowdown that is already. Let's not forget, we were even debating a few months ago, oh, this will be a hard landing, even without right. a banking situation. Uh, it's completely inappropriate for me to ask you about Deutsche Bank, but there I was in Davos standing with you and Mr. Saving long ago and far away as he was coming in to salvage the bank. Away from Deutsche Bank, explain to our American audience why European financial banking dynamics are so different and original from the American model. Well, there are a lot of academic studies that show you that the deposit beta, in other words, how sensitive deposits are to interest rates, has tended to be lower in Europe. So that means also, therefore, that the propensity to move money quickly in and out of your accounts, like we're seeing in the weekly data from the Fed last Friday in the US, where money was moved mm -hmm. from small banks, about 120 billion outflow to 60 <clears throat> billion inflow to large banks, that has basically a more significant, more pronounced effect right. in the US relative to what we see in Europe. Over the weekend, the Financial Times did a full treatment of the Swiss culture and their banking. And again, it was 78% or whatever of the Swiss people are dead set against this mating of these two banks. Not on those two banks, but do the people of Europe have a voice in this? Or is it the elites, the elites above high that get to fix EU banking? Well, one very important difference between the US and the European banking sector is that the European banking sector is much more dominant. In other words, we have a bank-driven financial Robin system. Robin Brooks said that chart out last night. Stunning. And, and it's, Lisa, stunning, it's the, the it's difference. It's the first thing. I, work with, I joined with Robin at the IMF in the, the early 1990s. But the conclusion is that it is very important conclusion that US has a market-based financial system. Europe has a bank-based financial system. And when you have a more bank-based financial system, the banks just play a more important role and whereas in the U.S., remember in the U.S., the vast majority of credit in the U.S. to the private sector comes from outside the banks. And that's very important because that, of course, means that the markets play a much more significant role. The U.S. financial system is much more diversified. If you want financing as a company, you could basically go to many more sources in the U.S. than you can in Europe. So there are two different things here. There's less deposit beta in Europe than there is in the U.S., but there are, is a greater dependency on banks so that it's more susceptible. It's an economy that's more susceptible to issues in the banking system. So if there is no issue in the banking system, if Credit Suisse was a troubled bank that had been troubled for a long time that came to a head on a, a number of different issues, then is lending going to remain stronger and thus foster a stronger economy in Europe than the U.S., which is more susceptible to market pricing that's moving quick. Well, it, it, that's correct. But the issue here is also what is the behavioral change going to be not only in U.S. regional banks, but in banks globally. And that's why if you do have a behavioral change where banks globally do begin to pull a bit back, then in a more bank-based economy, you would expect a more negative effect simply because the banks are playing a bigger <coughs> role. That's why the well. diversification of the U.S. financial system, that you have so many more different places to go. If we were a company, we wanted to forget 
financing, we could go to a bank. If that said no, well, then we could go to bond markets, to venture capital, to private capital, to private credit, to private equity. There's so yeah. many more places to raise funds in U.S. financial markets, which is really the beauty of U.S. capital markets, yeah. that they are so much more diversified and therefore more able to provide the financing that's needed. Well, we're going to make a decision here. Elise is going to take a break here before the important 9 o'clock hour here to get these markets open. Futures up 27. Torsten, should I lose the beard or not? I mean, that's really the basic. Well, I started thing growing one like you here during the pandemic. Yeah, but so it, look, it looks suave <laughs> on you. On me, you know, there's, it's up and down. I mean, oh, well, you guys always look good here. <clears throat> well, we're, you know, Lisa, I know you're going <laughs> right, to go away right. here, but we got to do this. Come back. We did a scientific <laughs> survey, which you can only do off the Bloomberg terminal. It's like 1,280 something. People say keep the beard, and there's one person who says lose the beard. And that person is the most important person it's to you, and that is the matters. bottom line. So that beard will and not I be here to her, tomorrow. I, you know, I mean, she's still bitter that Purdue was a loser in the uh -huh. first round of Farley Dickinson, but she grew up on the edge of the Elkhart Amish district in western Indiana. These are a hugely important part of the Indiana economy. And I got an email from her last night. She said, you got to lose a beard before you come in. I go, no, I'm not, folks. And she said, well, at least use honest Amish. And I was like, what? And she's, she's you know, R Rachel's talking to me about honest Amish beard wax as being the only way to go. And it's what got me through the day here yeah, in terms can, of not itching. Maybe you can, like, pair the beard wax with your bow tie wax, and then it could be lapel wax, and we've got a fully You're waxed Tom waxed. Keen. It's fantastic. What we're gonna have is, well, trust me, folks, we're going to have no beard tomorrow, and that's been a part of it. But part of it, Lisa, is to bring this back to the what we do here. My travels shows a boom economy. There's no recession out there. Which is really what Torsten was really getting at, which is everyone's looking around themselves and seeing everything's strong. So if you're backwards looking, you're going to keep hiking rates, but the forward look looks different. So how do you extrapolate out at a time where there's a dissonance between what we're looking at now and the reality that yeah. may come? Torsten Slock, thank you so thank much. You so that much, was fantastic Torsten. to have really you here, good. honestly. By the way, coming up on the open, I'm going to leave because, you know, I'm going to okay. just, the wax <laughs> is overwhelming me. Wax, yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> coming up on the open, Ella Hocha of Pikte, Brian oh, Levitt of Invesco, and Jack Manley of J.P. Morgan. We're going to be talking about the calm and how long you can bet on the calm as we look ahead to well, possibly what could be a more disruptive second half. Small caps up 1.3 percent, as you mentioned earlier, Lisa, NASDAQ behind. But I'm sorry, there's a certain oomph to this market this morning, I guess on the good news of the uh, First Republic and the others up ginormous amount. It's the hmm. good news of the lack of news. Nothing blew up. Yay, yeah, let's go think, in. I do think <laughs> that that's, that, that that's... is tangible. Uh, dollar weakness there, uh, maybe off the schnabel comments, Bloomberg report that uh, uh, Dr. Schnabel of Germany saying higher rates is still something that makes sense. Stay with us, Adam Posen, next. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Silicon Valley Bank branches will open under a new name today. The FDIC says First Citizens Bank shares has agreed to buy the failed lender more than two weeks after its collapse. The North Carolina-based firm will purchase all of their deposits and about $72 billion of SVB's loans at a discount of $16.5 billion. Some $90 billion in securities will remain in receivership. Credit Suisse faces the threat of a possible investigation and disciplinary action over how top managers ran the bank in the lead-up to its collapse. Switzerland's banking regulator told a Swiss newspaper that officials are considering options. She says Credit Suisse had a cultural problem that led to a lack of accountability. In Israel, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is considering a delay in his judicial overhaul plan after a night of demonstrations. Thousands protested after Netanyahu fired his defense minister for criticizing his plan to reduce the power of the Supreme Court. In Germany, it's a day of travel chaos. Air and rail services came to a halt due to a one-day strike. Workers are demanding bigger pay hikes because of inflation. And in France, unions are planning a 10th day of strikes tomorrow over President Emmanuel Macron's decision to raise the retirement age. Millions of people have joined the protest since January. And Apple CEO Tim Cook discussed supply chain issues with China's commerce minister today. That underscored the importance of the relationship between the leading U.S. consumer tech companies and its key partner. Apple is looking to diversify production. Still, its most important products are predominantly assembled in China. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
interest rates were clearly on the upwards path, the failure to do any kind of stress test about interest rate uh, increases manifests a misunderstanding of what a major source of risk uh, in the system was. The former Secretary of the Treasury, Lawrence Summers, there uh, with Bloomberg over the weekend, I believe, with David uh, Weston, and talking there about this banking crisis. If you're just joining us on a good Monday morning, it's simple. Pricing is better. Better in Europe, pricing is better in America as well. Seven-tenths of a percent up on Standard & Poor's futures. The level there, I think, is just extraordinary. 4,028 on SPX futures, up 27 uh, uh, points right now. The VIX comes in constructively, 21.35. It is very important at Bloomberg Surveillance, it's been our tradition for decades, that we try to capture the zeitgeist among the adults in the room. This weekend, Jason Furman, who has to speak to Ec 10 in the room at Harvard, said, shut up and read it. And basically, shut up and read it is the new, to quote Furman, Professor Furman, phenomenal and hard-hitting essay by Adam Posen of the Peterson Institute. Dr. Posen is definitive on German culture. Dr. Posen is definitive of synthesizing together American policy and our economics. Uh, Adam Posen, I, I want to begin, first of all, with buried in your wonderful paragraph-by-paragraph paragraph article, is that Trump-Biden trade policy gives us the risk of losing American jobs. I thought we were gaining jobs by Intel factories from sea to shining sea. Afraid not, Tom. Uh, initially, you might gain a few. Thank you so much for the intro and for having me today on surveillance. The issue is, first, we've only got a finite number of skilled workers, people from these companies, Intel, Qualcomm, TSMC, Tokyo Electron. They don't have the American workers here who can do the job. And if they do, they have to hire them away from someplace else. It's not like skilled engineers are unemployed in the U.S. right now. We need immigration to get that up. Second, if you put all this stuff and you force it to be built here at higher expense, then what you get is less competitiveness for the rest of the country. They're going to be paying more for semiconductors. They're going to be paying more for equipment. And that's fine if you think it serves some goal, but it's certainly going right. to hurt jobs. And third, you're never going to export any of this because what you're doing is you're bringing stuff home, so to speak, in order to make it uncompetitive. We've sort of done this with turning NAFTA into USMCA. We've increased the rules of origin, meaning more domestic content. And as a result, fewer exports. So on that, this is not a jobs creation program. Someone who was definitive on this and the strength of the Peterson Institute was William Klein. All of our debate, including GOP and Democrats, is simplistic bilateral tension. And William Klein had the courage to say, you've got to think multilateral and differential bilateral of Singapore and China, Singapore and Mexico, Mexico and South Korea. How naive are we in a simplistic China-U.S. study? Well, Bill is right, and I'm trying to make the same kind of case that there's what economists call general equilibrium, but in international relations, that the U.S. cannot simply say, we do this, you have to play along, and no one's going to react. Other countries, you mentioned Singapore, South Korea, Mexico, Australia, India, they have agency. They do not just have to passively deal with whatever yeah. the U.S. does. And if the U.S. decides to play hardball to make them play along, then we become a police force and make enemies. So it's not a viable strategy. I wouldn't describe it to naivete. I describe it to overconfidence and ideological blinders. At a gunpoint years ago, I was forced to read Ricardo 1817 cover to cover. And to be honest, folks, David Ricardo, who is so much of this based off of in 1817, you know, it's a tough read. It's 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 uh, there, there's some distance to it centuries ago. Adam Posen, our trade policy is based from a distance on maybe Bretton Woods, maybe the middle 20th century. Do we need a new trade policy for a more open technological world? We need a new trade policy in the U.S. because we haven't been open. 
we, the rest of the world's continue to open up, continue to do more trade, more investment. And as I argued in a foreign affairs piece a couple of years ago, the U.S. has been deglobalizing basically since NAFTA, certainly since 2000. And so all this blaming everything on the China shock doesn't make any sense because every other country was exposed to the China shock and they continued to grow or they had the same decline in manufacturing jobs. You mentioned Germany. We did a look at North Rhine-Westphalen, the Ohio of Germany, and compared it directly with Ohio. They lost more manufacturing jobs than we did, despite their trade surplus, despite all these things that the Americans claim the Germans did. And so the, our trade policy isn't the problem. It's our mm -hmm. politics that is the problem that refuses to recognize that America can't have everything it wants and that some people in rural manufacturing jobs have to adjust like the people who've been in services in cities have adjusted through the years. Can there be a middle ground in Washington on trade or do we just need to live to the polarity that we've seen for the last eight, nine, 10 years? I'm not sure it's, this is one of the few issues, Tom, where I don't think it's an issue of polarity. I think it's large part of the Democratic Party, Excuse large me, yes. part of the Republican yeah. Party have come together. My error. It's, it's, yeah. No, no, it's fine. But I mean, it's just to say the extremism is the majority position. And just as on other issues, like communism in the 50s at home, like environmental issues before the 70s, like civil rights, I don't mean to say this is on a par with those, but just to say, Congress and the right. popular views sometimes are wrong. We have to confront that these views, even if popular and widespread, are wrong. Adam, you lead with America's zero-sum economics. I mean, this is like Chad Jones out on the West Coast talking to a solo 101. I mean, how do we get away from what we all intuitively understand is not a good thing, zero-sum economics? How do we get back to something constructive off of solo 1957? Great question. I think there's two tracks. One is we have to be more aggressive about confronting China and others in the diplomatic and military space. This whole part of the whole trade issue is people in foreign policy security not wanting to do the dangerous and hard work on the security side and hoping they can sub economics for it, but it doesn't work. It's not that economics is more important, it's it just it doesn't work. So beef up the security side, pick a few technologies, really cram on that. The second side, as you said, is Solo-esque or Robert Gordon or anything like that. Huge public investment, yes, not industrial policy to exclude other countries, not industrial policy to maximize production at home, but made by America instead of made in America. Money towards R&D, money towards education, money towards supporting standards that let us get innovation from the free world. Those are the two tracks I would go on for made by America instead of made in America. Yeah. Adam Posen, uh, wonderful to get started here on our IMF coverage here. And, of course, this article, folks, I really can't say enough about. Don't listen to me. Listen to Professor Furman up at uh, Harvard. America's zero-sum economics doesn't add up. It is without question the read of the weekend from Adam Posen of the Peterson Institute and a good launch for our coverage that you will see from original spring meetings of the International Monetary Fund. I really I got goosebumps about it, folks. Of uh, we're through the pandemic, we're back to some form of normality as IMF moves to Morocco in October. And all I can say is these meetings, even with the banking crisis in place, are really, really important. Let me get back to the good news that we see in the market. Lisa Bramutz will drive forward the John Farrell uh, Hour. That's what that's a new name for it, by the way, the John Farrell Hour. And Lisa's going to be doing that for you, Mr. Farrell, uh, on a holiday for a number of, of days here. Futures up 25, Dow futures up 221, the VIX 21.43. Very constructive market led by small caps up 1.2%. Uh, Big lift there. The real story in the last hour has been the two year yield with a vengeance up 19 basis points. That's a huge move for those keeping score. 3.96% uh, as well. Curve disinversion and the real yield. This has been something that Torsten Slack was uh, talking about here. Just a leveling down of the real yield. Really an interesting uh, conundrum there as we have many Fed speakers today. I'd also note on, on oil up $1.38 here on West Texas Intermediate. 76.33 on Brent crude, 70.61 on West Texas uh, Intermediate, seeing some kind of the move equivalency in Germany as well as they end their uh, day. Some dollar weakness as well. 
It is a Monday of an extraordinary week. Please stay with us through the week on the American, uh, through the week, I should say, on the American banking crisis. And the good news is America's smaller regional banks, they advance this morning. Please stay with us on radio and television. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg. 